Welcome everyone. I now call the September 20th, 2022 regular City Council meeting to order. Please rise and join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. The City of Bothell is now providing the option of attending council meetings remotely or in person. Public comment will be allowed both in writing or verbally. Verbal comments may be taken either in person or remotely. Sign-up sheets were provided online by the City Clerk's Office via link from the agenda. A call-in number was provided on the meeting agenda for members of the public who wish to call in by phone to listen live to the meeting. If you have called in, we ask that you mute your device so as not to interfere with the meeting. If a participant fails to mute their connection and causes a disruption to the meeting, the connection will be terminated. At this point in time, we will take a moment to call roll of the council members by position number. Please say here when the city clerk calls your name. Council Member Zorn. Here. Mayor Thompson. Here. Council Member Alderks. Here. Council Member McNeil. Council Member Mankey. Here. Deputy Mayor Alcabra. Here. All present with the exception of Council Member McNeil, who's absent and excused. Thank you, City Clerk. Next, I'd like to reiterate some meeting guidelines. For all remote meeting attendees, please speak clearly and pause frequently. State your name each time before speaking and mute your microphone when not speaking. We have no council attending remotely, so I am going to skip those guidelines. The first item on the agenda is meeting agenda approval. Are there any changes to tonight's agenda? Seeing none, um, let's move to public engagement opportunities. September is Puget Sound Starts Here month. Take the Puget Sound Starts Here online pledge and learn simple ways that you can help protect local waterways. You can learn more at bothellwa.gov slash PSSH. What Goes Where Workshop is September 25th from 5 to 6 p.m. You can stop by the Recology Store to learn how to recycle right and get answers to your recycling, compost, and garbage questions. You can learn more at bothellwa.gov slash recology store. Pollution Prevention Week. September 19th through 25th is Pollution Prevention Week. Learn seven tips for preventing pollution, then take our Pollution Prevention Quiz to test your pollution IQ. And that's bothellwa.gov slash p2week. All right, moving on, we have presentations, and we have one in particular that I'm quite excited about for Maureen Schultz, our interim finance director. All right, whereas Maureen Schultz joined the city of Bothell as an accounting technician on September 24th, 1990, when the city's population was 12,345, and whereas Maureen has honorably served the citizens of Bothell for 32 years, during which time the population has increased to 48,940, and whereas Maureen worked her way up in the finance department, serving in the following positions, accounting technician, accounting specialist, senior accounting specialist, financial analyst, budget, and internal auditor, interim finance manager, finance manager, deputy finance director, and two stints as interim finance director. And whereas Maureen is the personification of a team player, doing what was necessary to support the finance department, city organization, and community when called upon. And whereas Maureen postponed her planned retirement earlier this year in order to serve as interim finance director for a second time, helping to provide stability as the city worked to find a new city manager. And whereas Maureen's shoe game is always on point. And whereas we celebrate Maureen's invaluable contributions of service and friendship and wish her all the best as she retires from the city and enjoys the next chapter of her life. Now therefore I, Mason Thompson, Mayor of the City of Bothell, do hereby proclaim the City of Bothell's appreciation to Maureen Schulz for her many contributions to the City of Bothell and our greater community. Thank you, Maureen.
Well, thank you, Mayor, Deputy, and City Council for this recognition. Um, it's been my honor to serve the city in my various roles in the finance department over these 32 years. I have taken great pride in my duty to ensure the safeguarding of public resources. Uh, I'd like to especially acknowledge the very talented finance staff. Some are here tonight. We are a small department, but we get a lot done. The financial operations of the city are successful because of the staff's dedication, hard work, and expertise in governmental accounting. Thank you for your support. I consider you not only coworkers, but family as well. And to the executive leadership team, thank you for the opportunity to serve alongside you. You are a group of collaborative and inspiring leaders, and I know that you will continue to serve the city well. And to the city council, thank you for your leadership and your desire to serve the community. And last, but certainly not least, a special thank you to my husband, Hank, who also retired earlier this year from the city of Bothell with 30 years and has been patiently waiting for my retirement date. <laughs> thank you. Thanks again for the recognition and I wish Bothell all the best in the days ahead. Thank you. And Maureen, I just want to say specifically thank you so much for postponing retirement. Thank Hank, thank you too, appreciate it, um, when we needed help. Because the last uh, couple years in the finance department seemed like it would have made me really look forward to retirement. Mm -hmm. and, and you put yours off. So, so thank you so much. We, we really, really appreciate it. And I, I really appreciate staff and I love you guys, but like if we don't have to do proclamations for retirement for people that I really like, in the next couple of weeks, that would be okay too, because we are going to miss not just who, what you do, but who you are. Thank you. Yeah. Um, Mo, thank you so much. I appreciate it as a new guy, a new guy, new person, I guess. Uh, thank you. You've made my life very easy to onboard, especially early on with all the information, especially back in uh, April when we had our offsites and you were very flexible and <clears throat> very informative, with deep wealth of knowledge that I will sorely miss from a city perspective, but we'll also miss your, your uh, the way you approach answering the questions. I, I very much appreciate it, thank you. I'd like to echo what the deputy mayor said. As a new council member, you made it very easy to come on board and learn about city finances, which are not an easy topic to learn about. So you simplified it for us. You made it easy to understand. Uh, you answered all of our questions and more. And I, I thank you for um, making that easy for us. And thank you for all of your service to the city. Thank you for delaying your retirement. I know that's something you look forward to, and uh, it's not something that you would like to carry through the summer. So I appreciate you helping us get through the audit this summer and carrying us all the way through till now. And we're definitely going to miss you. Please don't, uh, don't be a stranger here. We hope to see you again soon. Okay, I wasn't gonna say anything. This is a secret wish of mine, and Hank, this, this applies to you too, is that when we have folks retire from the city, I would really love it if you came to council meetings periodically, and when we're talking about things, a well-timed gasp would be really fantastic. <laughs> so you come back and haunt us anytime, please, but otherwise enjoy sleeping in and, and, and uh, creating your own schedule and just enjoying life. You've really earned it. All right, I'll jump in too. Um, thank you so much for, uh, for the welcome, for the education, um, for even just setting us up for um, a good handoff as you, as you take off um, into retirement. Um, but really, you also just like gave away a summer <laughs> and just decided to stick around when you could have really been enjoying yourself this summer. So um, now that the weather's going to start getting colder and changing, um, yeah, enjoy your winter, I guess. And you'll have to wait until next summer to enjoy your first summer of retirement. But thank you so much for delaying. Thank you for being here uh, for all of us and for all the work and service you've provided to the community for, for so many years. Really appreciate it. Someday I'm really hoping that somebody shows up like in a Hawaiian shirt and like, you know, super relaxed, like a hat that's like they've been out in the sun. And it's like, yep, we're getting this party started early. 
All right, next up. <laughs> Enjoy. Um, next up, we have a proclamation for Childhood Cancer Awareness Week. Whereas the American Cancer Fund for Children and Kids Cancer Connection report cancer is the leading cause of death by disease among U.S. children between infancy and age 15. This tragic disease is detected in more than 16,000 of our country's young people every year. An estimated 400,000 children and adolescents are diagnosed with cancer globally every year. And whereas one in five of our nation's children loses their battle with cancer, many infants, children, and teens will suffer from long-term effects of comprehensive treatment, including secondary cancers. And whereas founded nearly 30 years ago by Stephen Firestein, a member of the philanthropic Max Factor Cosmetics family, the American Cancer Fund for Children Incorporated, Kids Cancer Connection Incorporated, and Lions Club International are dedicated to helping these children and their families. And whereas the American Cancer Fund for Children and Kids Cancer Connection provide a variety of vital patient psychosocial services to children undergoing trans cancer treatment at Seattle Children's Hospital, Mary's, Mary Bridge Children's Hospital in Tacoma, as well as participating hospitals throughout the country, thereby enhancing the quality of life for these children and their families, and whereas the American Cancer Fund for Children and Kids Cancer Connections also sponsor toy distributions, sailing programs, positive appearance services, pet assisted therapy, laughter noon, laughter is healing, KCC supercar experience, positive appearance programs, educational programs, and hospital celebrations in honor of a child's determination and bravery to fight the battle against childhood cancer. Now, therefore, I, Mason Thompson, Mayor of the City of Bothell, do hereby proclaim September 25th through October 1st, 2022 as Childhood Cancer Awareness Week in the City of Bothell. And City Clerk, I believe we don't have anybody here to accept, correct? That is correct. We will mail it out to them. All right. We have two more proclamations. I think I can make it through without getting a lozenge. Next up is Puget Sound Starts Here Month. Whereas Puget Sound and the waterways that connect our mountains to the shore contribute in numerous ways to Bothell's economic infrastructure, quality of life, and our natural resources, and whereas the City Council's environmental sustainability goal includes protecting the natural environment through integrated natural resource management, and whereas water quality is a priority for the health and welfare of the Bothell community, and whereas Bothell has joined with state agencies and more than 750 local organizations, governments, and tribes to engage residents in protecting and improving local and regional water quality. And whereas Puget Sound Starts Here Month is an opportunity for the public to learn how they can help clean up Puget Sound and our local waterways. Now, therefore, I, Mason Thompson, Mayor of Bothell, do hereby proclaim the month of September 2022 as Puget Sound Starts Here Month in the city of Bothell and call upon all in our community to protect natural resources by reducing and eliminating sources of water pollution. We have one more, and then you're up. We have National Pollution Prevention Week. Whereas the United States Environmental Protection Agency acknowledges National Pollution Prevention Week in honor of the United States Congress passing the Pollution Prevention Act in 1990, and whereas the Pollution Prevention Act encourages pollution prevention by reducing or eliminating waste at the source by modifying production processes, promoting the use of non-toxic or less toxic substances, implementing conservation techniques, and reusing materials rather than adding them to the waste stream, and whereas the City Council's environmental sustainability goal includes protecting the natural environment through integrated natural resource management, and whereas the City of Bothell implements programs that aim to reduce and prevent pollution generated by businesses, residents, and municipal operations by partnering with the community to protect our environment, including our wetlands, streams, lakes, and rivers. Now, therefore, I, Mason Thompson, Mayor of Bothell, do hereby proclaim the week of September 19th to, through 2020, 25th, 2022, as National Pollution Prevention Week in the City of Bothell, and call upon all in our community to protect natural resources by reducing and eliminating sources of pollution. And I think we have Christy Cox here to accept both proclamations. Oh, look at that, right there. On, there we go. Yes, thank you very much, Mayor Thompson, for both proclamations. I will gladly accept them. Maybe one year I'll actually combine them into one. <laughs> so save your voice a little bit.
All right. So yeah, then uh, next up, um, staff briefing, uh, City Manager Stannard. Yeah, absolutely. And good evening, Mayor, Deputy Mayor, and members of the City Council. We do roll right in appropriately. It's almost like this was coordinated. Um, but we heard a little bit of the highlights of some of the work that um, the city is is supporting. And um, I'm excited to uh, welcome Christy Cox to then do a brief staff report talking about uh, the surface water program. She is our surface water program coordinator and she's going to be sharing some of the highlights from this year and also um, touching on a few more things to come that uh, might be of interest to the council and the community. So with that, I'll turn it over to Christy. Thank you. Good evening, Mayor, Deputy Mayor and Council. My name is Christy Cox and I'm one of the surface water program coordinators for the city of Bothell. My role is to teach residents how they can help prevent stormwater pollution to help create cleaner water in our local streams, rivers, and wetlands. But before I dive in, I think it's important to, def to define what stormwater pollution is. So when I use that term stormwater pollution, I'm talking about anything that rain or snow melt picks up along its path to a storm system or a body of water. It usually flows over hard surfaces like rooftops, driveways, and roads before emptying into the nearest storm drain. From there, it flows without treatment to the closest body of water. Some examples of stormwater pollution include excess fertilizer, vehicle fluids, pet waste, paint, suds, soap suds, and litter. Our surface water education and outreach program is a requirement of what is called our NPDES Western Washington Phase II Municipal Stormwater Permit, which is a mouthful, NPDES part stands for National Pollutant Discharge Elimination System, but for obvious reasons, we just call it our stormwater permit. The Washington State Department of Ecology issues this permit to us, and it allows us to discharge stormwater to our storm system, streams, rivers, and lakes as long as we minimize pollution to the maximum extent practicable. On the screen, you can see eight of the required elements of the permit, but today I will only be focusing on the public education and outreach. So tonight I'm not going to go into detail about our year round programs since this update is just focused on the highlights of the year, but I will at least mention our core programs. So we have natural yard care, pet waste, vehicle leaks and maintenance, septic system care, our 24 hour spill hotline, our capture the rain techniques that include things like rain barrels or building a rain garden. Our youth, youth stormwater education programs that are offered in all Bothell schools. And environmental stewardship, which is often in partnership with other local organizations. So now we can get into the highlights from 2022. This spring, we were able to do the first planting in North Shore YMCA's community food garden. This garden is part of Snohomish Conservation District's Lawns to Lettuce program, and it was a partnership project between the North Shore YMCA, Snohomish and King Conservation Districts, North Shore School District, and the city. Here's a nice before and after image of the courtyard showing some of the new beds, one of the rain barrels, some plants that are finally planted in the beds, and a banner. These vegetables and herbs that are grown in the garden help provide food security to the North Shore School District families in need through the Totes to Go program. And the garden itself will be used as a teaching element for YMCA youth to promote urban agriculture and stewardship. YMCA staff, volunteers, and after-school program participants are learning to maintain the garden, and Snohomish Conservation District is always available for guidance and technical assistance. The courtyard garden includes 10 raised beds and two rain barrels that, are, that collect rainwater from the roof of the building. A drip irrigation line is connected to each rain barrel, and the lines are run through the middle of the beds to provide easy watering. Here you are looking at last spring's first planting of veggie starts that were grown by Snohomish Conservation District, including tomatoes, tomatillos, cilantro, and eggplant. 
This picture is actually from last year at the garden's unveiling celebration before we'd actually planted anything. But I just love the picture. Um, you can see some familiar faces in here. There's Council Member Zorns and former Council Member McAuliffe, who has probably one of the best masks I think I've ever seen. But I was very appreciative of Council's support for this project and helping us make it happen. Now you're looking at a picture of our Martin Luther, Martin Luther King Jr. Day of Service volunteer event with the Friends of North Creek Forest. These volunteers are clearing Himalayan blackberry out of Melissa's Meadow in North Creek Forest, which if you've ever tried clearing blackberry, you know it's a tedious and endless task. So although we had a small group, they were a very mighty group and they accomplished a lot that day. For Earth Day this year, we worked with Tilth Alliance to host two sessions of a container gardening workshop at Blythe Park for herbs and pollinator friendly plants. Each session started with some lessons about pollinators, good bugs versus bad bugs, and simple tips about growing food. It was, a great, it was great to see even the youngest members of Bothell families get involved. In June, we celebrated Pollinator Week as we have in the past with a social media campaign and our Pollinator Pop Quiz. One new thing that we did this year was to create bee-friendly seed mix packets to send to quiz participants to give them a simple way to create a pollinator-friendly area in their own yards. Next, I want to mention some of our pet waste outreach efforts. I realize that it may not seem all that exciting, but pet waste is outreach that's more effectively done face-to-face, -face. so I was really glad that COVID wasn't such a hindrance this year. With pet waste, our main message is that we want dog owners to pick up after their dogs and put the waste in the trash every time. In March, Bothell Police held a free pet vaccine and microchip event where we got to set up a booth and talk with people about our pet waste program. Next month, they're putting on another free microchip and vaccine event. This one will be just for Bothell residents, so you'll see us there again in a few weeks. Last May, on opening day of the pop-up dog park, Animal Control Officer Boucher and I set up a table in the park to welcome, or welcome back, dogs and their owners and work on developing good rapport with them. As part of this year's week-long Sustainomania event, Officer Boucher and I again set up shop inside the dog park for Puget Sound Starts here day. We used this as an opportunity to talk with dog owners about why picking up pet waste matters, and we provided them with pet waste pickup swag to make cleanup duty a little easier. At this particular event, I learned that it's not a good idea to use a full length cloth tablecloth in an area where dogs like to mark their territory. <laughs> to wrap up summer, we partnered with Parks and Recreation and Bothell Police to put on an event called the Dog Days of Summer, sort of as a last hurrah before the pop-up dog park closes to replenish the grounds. You're looking at a picture of what we call, for lack of better words, the poop toss game. Uh, this is a game that we modeled after Snohomish County's version, and it's meant to help people understand why Petway should go in the trash instead of elsewhere. After scooping one of the fake piles of dog waste, you have the option to, top it in, to toss it in the compost bin, the garbage, or into a fake hole in the ground. And this is usually more of a kid's activity, but the benefit is that their caregivers are usually nearby listening, so they also learn something as the kids are actually modeling the behavior that we want them to do. Another feature of this year's Sustainomania celebration was a rain barrel painting event at City Hall where 10 Bothell families got to get creative and paint rain barrels. Snohomish Conservation District hosted the workshop and provided all materials. And thanks to funding from our waste reduction and recycling grant, the families got to take home these rain barrels for free. You can see we have some very creative community members who would put my art skills to shame. And this was the first time that we did an event like this, but we got really positive feedback and it's something that I'd love to be able to offer again. 
pretty sure council is already familiar with the adopt a drain program thanks to a challenge issued by council member Zorns earlier this month this is a regional stewardship program that so far includes 13 Puget Sound jurisdictions the goal is for residents to adopt their local storm drain to help prevent flooding and stormwater pollution participants sign up online and commit to checking on their storm drain once or twice a month and removing any leaves litter or other debris that's near or on the grate. A few times a year, we ask the participants to report how much debris they've cleaned up online so that we can track the community's collective input. Bothell just joined the program earlier this month, so in less than three weeks, we've already had 55 drains adopted, which I think is a pretty great start. Right now, we're in the midst of salmon season. This is a program run by King County, highlighting salmon viewing locations throughout the region, including North Creek here in Bothell. It's also not too late to sign up for UW Bothell Professor Jeff Jensen's Salmon Watcher program, where you can help collect information about local salmon sightings. And the last highlight that I want to talk about is, of course, Puget Sound starts here month, which just happens to be this month. This is a time when hundreds of organizations throughout the region work together to spread the word about stormwater pollution prevention. This year's campaign, campaign is focused on car care, including keeping tires properly inflated, checking for and fixing vehicle leaks, and washing your car safely. Before I wrap up tonight, I wanted to mention a few upcoming opportunities for the community. We'll be celebrating Orca Recovery Day again this year on October 15th with a volunteer event to plant native plants in part of the front nine of the former Wayne Golf Course. We'll be partnering with Whale Scout, One Bothell, and Orca Conservancy for this all ages event, which should be a lot of fun. This next event might not sound as fun, but it's definitely useful for those who need it. We still have about 2,000 residents in Bothell that are on septic systems. So this is a workshop that we've started offering annually. On October 19th, we'll hold this online septic sense workshop in partnership with Snohomish Conservation District and one of the leading septic specialists from Washington Sea Grant. I also want to make a plug inviting residents and businesses to provide feedback about our annual Stormwater Management Plan. This is a permit required report that we update each year outlining our programs and your feedback helps us create the following year's plan. I'd like to end with a parting message of only rain down the drain. Information about all of our programs is available online at bothellwa.gov slash surface water. Thank you so much for your time and I'm happy to answer any questions you have. Council Member Zorns. Well, first off, I have to confess, every time we talk about septic, anyone who's watched the Red Green Show, I cannot help but think sewage and septic sucking services. So, so at any rate, anyone who can make that funny, I don't know. But at any rate, so I have a couple questions and uh, comments uh, before I forget about it. I did a field trip today with Raya 8 down at the um, Issaquah Fishery. And we talked to King County Conservation about getting bare root available earlier so that it can be, can, it can establish itself better and have survivability. So mm -hmm. maybe that will happen. That would, I hope so. That would be a good thing. Mm -hmm. um, and then gardening for food security, that poor little YMCA garden, it's food security for about one or two people. Anything that I could do to help support community gardening, um, let me know. Um, th that's, that's really important. Um, and then I have a question. Um, my daughter has a theory from her bio friends that Himalayan blackberries are actually secret carnivores because their thorns are angled in so you get trapped and you can't get out. I don't know if that's true or not, but the blackberries don't play fair. Um, so my question is, when I do battle blackberries, I'm like, what about goats? So can you tell me about, does the city ever have conversation about getting goats in for blackberries, and what's the good and bad of them? 
I, I can't tell you the good and bad of them. I do remember, I think years ago when I just was starting in this position, I think there was someone trying to get goats in the city. I don't know whatever came of it. Um, I've heard they are pretty effective. Okay. Yeah. I would. But I can get back to you with I would. I would think, you it. know, if they're far enough from a stream edge, things would compost before it got into yeah. the waterways. But I'm, yeah. I'm remembering, I think one of the stories I heard was goats near a stormwater pond and maybe one of the goats in the stormwater oh, pond no. that had a oh, no. earlier ending than hopes. Oh, no. So <laughs> yeah. No, no, that been. wouldn't be good. Yeah. I can, yeah. Yeah. I can that's, dig up. That's dig a little bit of a failure. You. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, thank you for thinking of everything, including pollinator week. Mm -hmm. That's a big deal. Um, and rain barrels. And um, I made some other notes. So thank you. Thank you for comp comprehensiveness through the whole year. And, you know, again, anytime I can help you, just let me know. Okay. Thank you. Thanks. I'll jump in and say I really appreciate this presentation, um, especially how comprehensive your um, your events are throughout the year. Um, it's always good to know that you know in some jurisdictions, collecting rainwater is considered illegal. Not here in Bothell. Um, and um, I do also want to thank you for receiving a seed pack. We did get one of those. <laughs> And also this last week, I got a uh, little yard sign for the adopt a Drain program. So um, I was not expecting that. And for anybody listening out there on the internet, uh, if when you adopt a drain, you get a little yard sign to declare to your community that you are a, uh, a Puget Sound protector. And um, yeah, it's kind of fun to... I actually am sticking it out like in the median, so my whole <laughs> block looks like where the dra the drain protectors. Anyway, um, but I really do appreciate just the way you get out there, the outreach, the events, bringing in um, people of all ages. Um, great work. Keep it up. Can't wait to see what um, what more you add to this. But this looks really great. Thank you. Thank you. When you follow up with Council Member Zorns on the goats, would you CC me on that, please? Oh, you'll all receive the email. Wonderful. My <laughs> wife asked me. A couple, <laughs> my wife asked me a couple days ago, "Why don't you use goats in Bothell?" And I'm like, "I'm gonna need you, you to be a little more specific." And then <laughs> we went down that road. Thank you so much. Absolutely. City Manager Stanner. Yeah. Thank you, Mayor. I have uh, one brief update and then a proposal for council to consider. Um, on the update, it has to do with our next meeting on October 4th. Uh, as you know, we do um, often have items that go on the consent calendar for council and the intent of the consent calendar is anything that's really following policy and um, but it does require council approval, but don't, it doesn't often get spotlighted. So we have one that was right on the edge that I just want to sh update council with, especially since many of you, this is a, a new process that you've been through, but uh, it has to do with the, um, with the city purchasing water meters uh, as we're going forward. So as you know, when you drive around the community, we have a pretty good uptick in, in development going on right now. And uh, what you may not be aware of is that the city's water division provides water meters for installation for private developers. And we do that to make sure that they meet all the requirements and are compatible with our system and are useful. As you can imagine, that's important. Um, there will be a request on consent on the 4th. And again, if there's questions, we can always pull it off and have some conversation. But really what we're looking for there is the city manager's uh, purchasing authority in excess of $100,000 for this year Part of the big driver of that is that with development being up, and then as you know from reading in the news, supply chain is is strained right now. And uh, our practice is to try and uh, keep uh, anywhere between a six to 12 month inventory on hand to make sure that we have equipment ready when they're needed. One thing just to be aware of with that purchase is that we actually do charge back to the development, uh, to developers, and so there is uh, cost recovery on this. So again, while the authority to purchase is there, will end up being budget neutral when all is said and done. Um, the current lead times are, are high, so that's part of where we're wanting to get ahead of that and move forward through with our vendor. So again, there'll be more information in the packet. You'll see an agenda bill on the 4th, but just wanted to highlight that too to make sure that there was no, um, no surprises and to also help our community members who are watching at home understand the context of that as well. 
The other um, item is then jumping ahead. So October feels like there's no way we, our next meeting is in October, but you, before you know it, we'll be in November, and then what happens? So uh, one of the things I wanted to highlight tonight is re recognizing that uh, our second meeting in November will be on November 8th, and um, that, that date might already be resonating for some people because it is an election evening. Uh, one of the, um, there has been some questions around scheduling of that meeting and seeing um, what we can do in order to make sure if there's anybody who is wanting to track elections at home. We have a lot of civically minded people who watch these meetings. Um, and so you know, when you have competing uh, things going on and there's no DER for this, for our council meeting, what are we going to do? So the proposal that, that has really been bubbling to the top is instead of moving our council meeting to another date, they're certainly not canceling it because we will be during budget season. Uh, there is a thought of having a special meeting that night of just focusing on a study session and having it be 100% focused on the city budget. Uh, we'll do the work of moving the budget forward, making sure that we're on track for adoption before the end of the year, which is obviously important to all of us, um, and then also be able to um, hold that meeting. Uh, we'll, we'll make sure that the times are compatible with being able to go and seeing the first set of election results from both King County and Snohomish County. Uh, so that's the proposal on the table. Um, welcome uh, feedback, or if there's any alternatives that you'd want us to consider. Otherwise, the city clerk will move forward with um, as we get closer to the meeting, I, I want to give a lot of lead time for, so people have awareness, but we'll also keep cognizant of what's coming up. And if something changes and we just don't have the luxury of changing it, we can certainly do that too. But otherwise, as we get closer to November, the city clerk would cancel the regular meeting, schedule a special meeting, and we would make that be a, a, a study session just focused on budget. Are you all looking at me because that's totally fine with you and sounds great? It's totally fine with me and sounds great too. Sounds good. All right. And we will, if there's anything that changes, we'll bring back more information. But thank right. you. Thank you. All right. Next up, we have council committee reports. Council Member Zorns. Um, uh, just a brief one from um, Raya 8. Uh, just a couple things. I won't give you the whole rundown. I did a field trip uh, a couple weeks ago to the locks, and um, the uh, sockeye forecast is four times more than what they the returns. Um, Chinook is three times more. Um, uh, Coho they they have forecasted fourteen thousand, um, but only counted four hundred and five. All those numbers are below recovery. So even though we have multiples of uh, what was predicted, it's still below recovery. So I thought you, you all might appreciate that. And then there was, uh, the, there was some budget talk, and, um, the, and it's going to be coming before city council later, I uh, believe, of having an 8.8% uh, increase in their budget versus 4.9% increase in their budget. And I said... I abstained because I needed to talk with you all first um, to decide what what would what would work. And um, later, I found out that uh, Public Works has already worked that increase into their budget, and so it's it's covered. So um, we're good there. And I don't think the rest is just you know federal priorities and state priorities that they're focusing in on. Um, which I don't think you need the details, but I did want to let you know about the increase, but staff is already planning for working that into the budget. Council Member Alderks. Um, I'd also like to give an update on the uh, Domestic Violence Regional Task Force. Uh, there was a letter that uh, members of the task force sent to um, King County requesting additional funding for um, advocates for people seeking protection orders. It was something that the auditor's report last year determined would be, um, that would help people navigate the system. And so uh, we decided that we would work together on that letter and submit it. So that got submitted, I believe, this week. Um, thank you, staff, for um, working with, with Holly for that one. So that's just a, a recent update there, too. 
All right. Seeing no more, um, we're going to move on to visitor comment. The city has accepted visitor comment in writing as well as accepted sign up sheets for those who wish to speak at tonight's meeting. Written comments submitted to the city clerk no later than 3 p.m. today were forwarded to all city council members and are part of the record. City clerk, do we have anybody signed up? We do. We have one sign up from Mark Willis, who's in the audience. Mr. Willis, if you'll come up to the podium, you'll have three minutes to speak. On the on. Good evening. Uh, I uh, just moved uh, here from uh, about as far as you can get to uh, Athens, Georgia. I know a little bit about playing football down there, but uh, uh, I'm happy to be here. Uh, I wanted to attend this meeting tonight just to get a little familiar with uh, the city workings and so forth. And I appreciate your uh, punctuality as well as your reports. Uh, and it's a pleasure to be in the uh, area. So that's as rigorous as uh, it gets. Uh, I am a, a retired recovering engineer, uh, but uh, happy to be here. Thank you very much. Thank you. That is all I have. Uh, however, I'm going to ask, there's a couple of members of the um, community in the attendee room. Um, so I'm going to ask if anybody wants to speak, please raise your hand, use the raise hand function and we will panel you in. So I'll give them a minute. City Clerk, would you mind explaining to Mr. Willis the, our policy about responding to public comment just so he doesn't think we're being unfriendly? Yeah, we, uh, Mr. Willis, we actually published the agenda on Thursdays prior to the meeting. And at that time, we have a link on the agenda that you can sign up to speak prior. But we always do have these sheets out here as well for the public if they want to come to the meeting. So, yeah. Oh, no, I, mi I meant just that we don't respond. So it's oh, not a right. two-way dialogue by policy. Sorry, I'm sorry. That's okay. Uh, <laughs> yeah, our policy is that we don't respond. So if there's any questions, um, you know, we'll look into it as at staff level and we can get back to you. <laughs> I realized it could be awkward and I didn't want it to be just because we were unfriendly. So <laughs> thank you. Um, next up is projected agenda discussion. Anybody on council have an item they'd like to bring up? All right. Next up is consent agenda. Um, could I get a motion to approve the consent agenda? A motion to approve the consent agenda. Second. Fantastic. I have a motion from Councilmember Aldricks and a second from Councilmember Zorns to approve the consent agenda. City Clerk. Please say yes or no when I call your name. Councilmember Zorns. Yes. Mayor Thompson. Yes. Councilmember Aldricks. Yes. Councilmember Mankey. Yes. Deputy Mayor Alcabra. Yes. Passes 5-0 with Councilmember McNeil absent and excused. All right, moving on to our first agenda bill of the evening. It's agenda bill 22128, approval of a professional services contract with the Bothell Kenmore Chamber of Commerce for management of the new visitor center. City Manager Stannard. Thank you, Mayor. Yes, as you mentioned, we do have one one contract before you and uh, the the contract itself, as you'll hear more in more detail, will be for professional services with the Bothell Kenmore Chamber of Commerce. It's a total of three hundred eighty five thousand dollars and that will be spent not in one year, but through uh, through the end of twenty twenty seven. Uh, contract is covered uh, for the management of the visitor center and paid for by City Lodging Tax Advisory Committee um, funds. You will hear more about that, and I'm pleased to uh, welcome Danae McGee, our Tourism and Arts Manager, here with presentation. And then we're also joined by the Chamber President, Brittany Caldwell, if, in case you have any additional questions. Go ahead, Danae. Thank you, everyone. Trying to find, oh, one moment, please. I need to rejoin the meeting.
Thank you. All right, I am the staff liaison uh, to the Lodging Tax Advisory Committee and I appreciate your time tonight. It's good to see everyone in person again. Um, <clears throat> I'm here um, with the, um, under the auspice to ask council to advise for distribution of hotel motel tax funds. This re request is asking council to consider adopting the contract in support of the new visitor center for $385,000 between LTAC and the Bothell Canmore Chamber of Commerce through 2027. The visitor center opened to the public in 2009 and its purpose was to alleviate confusion and streamline inquiries from visitors and potential residents and businesses fielded by both city and chamber staff. A brick and mortar visitor center is a desirable presence in a small walkable downtown like Bothell to maintain the friendly, approachable and accessible cadence the Begin at Bothell brand promotes through their advertising and marketing channels to potential visitors. A more recent goal was to move the visitor center to Main Street since that's the primary location for visitor spending. The goal was achieved in 2017 but the only space available at the time was the location in the slide before you, which is the second floor of the Mills building. This space is not ADA accessible. The new location is on the ground floor and is ADA accessible thanks to the renovations that are currently underway. This space is also located on the portion of Main Street between Bothell Way and 101st, which thanks to improvements will generate more foot traffic to this portion of the street and therefore give an additional boost to nearby businesses such as Graham's Royalty. The purpose of a five-year contract is to align with the lease agreement the Chamber signed with PMF Investment Company and LTAC voted unanimously to support using hotel motel tax funds for the increased rent of this new space and therefore supports adoption of the five-year contract before you this evening. Council has approved the existence of a brick and mortar visitor center using hotel motel tax funds since 2009 and most recently supported the visitor center back in April of this year when they dedicated $59,400 of American Rescue Plan Act funds or ARPA funds for this project. As a quick reminder, hotel motel tax funds are restricted and um, there's three activities in which these funds can be used. Uh, one is um, tourism marketing. This is the Street Sense contract that we have in place for marketing and promoting the Begin at Bothell brand and website. Marketing and operations of special events designed to attract tourists and operations of tourism facilities such as our visitor center. Visitor cent center funding for this contract includes the following. It does not take into account the chamber's contribution from both rent and staffing. This contract covers rent and staffing starting next month through 2027. General fund dollars are not used for the visitor center. Thanks to ARPA support, LTAC contribution of hotel motel tax funds will remain the same amount as the current contract in place. This amount is $1,300 per month for rent or $19,500 through 2023. The ARPA support of $59,400 is essential since LTAC was negatively impacted by the pandemic and is still recovering from those losses. These ARPA funds will be expended by the end of 2023. Rental costs beginning in 2024 through 2027 will be paid using hotel motel tax funds only. Rental costs are increasing with the new space and $230,500 represents the total rental costs through 2027. Staffing support will remain the same as the current contract, which is $1,200 per month through 2027 for a total cost of $75,600. The figures combined on this screen is the total of $385,000 for a five-year contract. I'm going to turn the presentation now over to Brittany Caldwell. She's the Executive Director of the Bothell Kenmore Chamber of Commerce 
and she's going to clarify some numbers and talk about the renovations. Hello, wonderful to see you all. Thank you so much uh, for the opportunity to present today and our continued partnership in supporting tourism throughout our community. And thank you to Danae and the tourism group for, for supporting this. We're incredibly excited about this opportunity presented to us and um, hope to answer any questions you may have. So talking a little bit more about the dollars. So starting in October, the portion of rent provided by the city of Bothell will be $4,166. And um, as Danae mentioned, this will be covered by the funds approved previously from ARPA. So that's a wonderful opportunity. Thank you again for approving those funds. That way that the funds from LTAC do not increase uh, until 2024. That gives the LTAC budget a little bit of an increase of time to recover. And uh, we're looking forward to going to back to pre-pandemic numbers with the LTAC budget. So if you may recall, the LTAC budget traditionally was a total of about $400,000. So even at this increase uh, rate of rent, which is not insignificant, it's still only 18% of the total annual LTAC budget. And as Danae I mentioned the funds can be used in three ways, marketing, events, and facilities like a visitor center. And LTAC agrees that that portion of that budget is a fantastic way to support a visitor center for a community like ours. So talking a little bit about who this visitor center will serve, we anticipate that this visitor center will serve over 2,400 visitors uh, each year. And that includes out of town guests, it includes our local residents who are looking for products and services and ways to spend, spend the day. Our number one request uh, at the or number one question is where's the trail? <laughs> How do I get to the water? So being down on Main Street and being able to assist guests to use all the assets and amenities available in our community. The second top question is I have a half of a day, I have a day, how do I spend it in Bothell? So to be able to have that customer service to um, you know, give them some tips and tricks of how to utilize our community is incredible. It also includes uh, opportunities for activation. So plan B of this is to really partner with the city staff, with council and the downtown business businesses to see how we can best activate this space. We want it to be a community space. We want to be a place that can host events and activities, uh, meeting space for small organizations or nonprofits that are looking for places to go. And um, also part, we've talked about partnering with the Arts Commission to showcase local artists. We have a wonderful hallway that you'll, I think, see a picture of. Um, that would be a great opportunity for that. So happy to answer questions about the space. Um, we're gonna show some pictures here today, talk about the renovations that are underway, and really appreciate you taking the opportunity to consider a five-year contract. It is a big commitment, but it is a commitment that is uh, with the building owner, the Chamber of Commerce, our board of directors, as well as the city. So appreciate the consideration. So this is the photo of the building. It was previously Allstate Insurance. If you may recall, it is the, the yellow tile. Uh, so it could use a little bit of vibrancy added to the exterior of the building as well as the interior. We have permits in now to add a storefront window. We're hoping to really truly activate the space um, by adding a storefront window that is potentially as large as 10 feet wide. This is the hallway that I mentioned. That would be a fabulous place to showcase local artists. So we're really excited to explore that. Um, and when we're talking about renovations, the chamber is committed to investing in, in these improvements. The building owner is also committed. The building owner is actually funding the ADA bathroom to make sure it is accessible for all guests. And costs are, are not going down. They are getting more expensive. It's been hard to get contractors and the help that we need. Um, but in partnership with Danae, we've actually submitted a grant to the Washington State tourism for um, visitor centers. So the grant was perfectly timed. We have our fingers crossed. It's up to $30,000 and it is specifically for visitor centers and capital improvements. So we're hoping to put those dollars to good use should we, they be received. This is the interior of the space. Uh, we are also connecting two spaces for a total of 1,800 square feet. Um, and also, I, I hear that people talk sometimes about parking. This space comes with eight parking spots. So we're incredibly excited to put those to good use to uh, attract our visitors to our downtown. And there is that window. So uh, we're hoping that the permits are approved so we can really activate it with that storefront window that you can see there in the photo. And with that, Thank you all very much for your consideration and happy to answer any questions. Councilmember Alderks. 
thank you so much for this presentation, um, especially for pursuing um, the additional funds. Um, I hope that you, you get those. Um, I was actually really excited to hear you mention that display window, um, mainly because display windows can be very inviting. Um, and just for the opportunity that that provides for us to, you know, seasonally dress up the window and like be welcoming and invite people in. I don't know if that's on your plan, but I'm looking forward to some displays. And I also know that there is a display contest happening around the holidays and you'll then have to be in it. Um, love the idea for displaying local art. And, um, and my ears perked up when you said event space for public meetings. So I hope that that's something we can um, let our community know about and, um, and so that they know this is an additional space for utilization. Thank you so much for this. Really appreciate the presentation and um, looking forward to a grand opening. Will there be a party? Absolutely. <laughs> cool. <laughs> uh, Deputy Mayor Alcabra, did you still want? Yeah, thank you. Uh, am I the only one who s starts the song, Hotel, Motel, Holiday Inn? No? <laughs> Maybe I'm the only one. Um, every time I read it through the agenda, that's what came to mind. Um, all right. um, you mentioned 2,400 visitors. Uh, can I ask how many, how you derived that number? Came to the yes, so, um, so that is visitors to the visitor center. So that includes our out of town guests as well as residents. So pre-pandemic, we were seeing um, greater than 600 visitors from out of town, out of state who mm. were visiting and, and coming through the visitor center. And that was in a location that was a bit hard to find. So we anticipate okay. that More. will definitely increase. Um, and especially with the collaboration with the city of Bothell, the begin at Bothell program and the marketing. Um, and then we also did uh, some quick calculations on some of the uh, activities that we know are coming the way, that way. For example, the um, wine, beer, and spirits walks that are hosted downtown, bringing visitors in. Uh, we think it would be a great way to showcase the assets of the community through partnering with that event as well as others. That's awesome. Because I was, uh, as I was reading, you, uh, you kind of alluded to it, Nay, but it in the agenda was said it will attract more business to that section of the city right here. So uh, I thought that would be an interesting use of the of that space, some ROI there in terms of revenue. Um, how are we going to replenish? Are you expecting to uh, the, uh, the, <laughs> the LTAC fund? <laughs> uh, how, how are we expecting to replenish that? I can't get it out of my mind. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Um, how are we going to replenish that? How was the plan to replenish that money? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, we are, um, we, we definitely have been more lean in the 2019, 2020, 21 years. We've cut back quite a bit on our marketing spending. Uh, we're starting to see some great um, activity in our hotels. And in fact, uh, we're on a two month um, slide, you know, from when the money actually comes in to when we see it. And we are starting to some, see some great pickup. In fact, we're bringing in more revenue than we anticipated for 2022. So we're feeling um, pretty optimistic about where things are at. And then with just the marketing that we already do, our sip and stay package, we're getting ready to launch a new program that we hope will also bring in more heads and beds, thanks to the ARPA funds that you approved back in April. So um, we're working hard to, to see some of those improvements in the tax. Awesome. Any ideas on like forecast of number, actual numbers on ROI on this investment? On the visitor center investment? Yeah. Ooh. Um, I don't haven't I don't think I have anything available right now, but I can definitely start putting together some numbers and present that back to you. When, Thank you. Yeah, that would be helpful. Once it opens and. Okay. Cool. Thank you. You're Appreciate welcome. it. Councilmember Zorns. I want you to hum a few bars. <laughs> um, I just am so thrilled with this. The location is a godsend for Main Street. Uh, I think it's going to be bringing vibrancy that Main Street has needed for a long time and expanding um, uh, the vitality of our city. And we've got our little pop shops down there. I think that's going to help redirect, you know, bring some attention to that. And, and then the businesses that are up at that end of the street, Grams and... Um, and then, you know, the 
mall strip that's across the street. It's I'm very excited. I just want to commend you. Uh, one concern that I think we all have is, as ARPA money has been spent is when we invested in things, is it going to be sustainable? And, and this is an example of, yes, we're forward thinking to make this sustainable. So I just want to commend you on that. Um, would that everything will, would go that way, but thank you for doing that. And I'm really excited. I can't wait till it opens up as well. But I think um, Brittany might be a little more excited than myself. It's a fantastic spot. We're excited about it. Councilmember Mankey. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you for the presentation. Um, thought it added some additional information we didn't have in our packets that I had some questions about. So thank you for preempting my questions. Uh, similar to the Deputy Mayor, just thinking along the lines of data and um, just thinking futuristically um, about visitor centers. Uh, I was talking to the city manager about it yesterday. When I look at a new city or visiting a new city, that's not the first thing I generally think of. Um, but I understand the importance of having one and what you laid out for us here, I think is um, exactly what a visitor center should be. It should be in a location that is highly trafficked. Um, I believe the old location was better than the previous location in Country Village, uh, but being upstairs on the second floor, it just didn't get the visibility that it needed. So I think this new storefront uh, location and the way you're designing it is exactly what a visitor center should be. So um, I, look, I look forward to that. Um, I would like to see the visit, visitation and the contacts track just for um, data for the next time we go into a contract so we have it and future council members don't ask those types of questions. I think the, the estimation that you have is probably pretty good, but um, just curious what, what, you know, what the ultimate outcome is. A uh, couple questions that I had or comments. Um, I love the thought of having weekend hours doing special events. I don't think that was in this presentation, but it was in the packet if I remember correctly. I think that's a great way to get people in the door, answer questions, get people excited and coming back, not just for one event, but for multiple events. Um, I do think that, um, again, the new location is great. And um, I don't know if it's something you're considering right now, but having like a uniquely Bothell gift shop of some sort inside, I don't want to take away from you know, the businesses that are already out there, but if it can feature local businesses, have things maybe that are harder to find, or, you know, we can we can link those things back to the businesses so people go there and explore for more um, of their products, I think that would be amazing. Um, again, not sure how much space we have there with 1,800 square feet. I know that gets filled up pretty quick, but uh, I just think it's a good idea, and thank you for all that you do. I know um, the last few years have been really tough with the, uh, the taxes being lower, uh, but I think... People are starting to get out again um, with the announcement yesterday or Sunday that the pandemic is over. I'm not quite sure <laughs> that's true. I mean, it's going to be around for a while, but uh, I am seeing a lot of people picking up and traveling, and I know I'm being sent um, places for work. So people often, when they are sent places for work, um, a lot of people come to Canyon Park for the business park and down in the North Creek Business Park, and I know that they come and explore when they're here. So I love, I love where you're going to be. Look forward to seeing it opening and... I know we'll all be there for the grand opening celebration. Thank you. Thank you. There's not much left to cover. You guys didn't leave me very much, but um, I'm just super thankful that we have the chamber we do. Brittany, I really appreciate you. Um, and with what we can spend this money on, I, I don't really see a better use of it. So um, I'm super excited about this as well. Councilmember Member Mankey. Thank you, Mayor. I'd like to move for the approval of the professional services contract with the Bothell Kenmore Chamber of Commerce for management of the new visitor center. Second. All right. I have a motion um, by Councilmember Mankey and seconded by Councilmember Zorns to approve the professional services contract with the Bothell Kenmore Chamber of Commerce for rental and staffing of the visitor center in the amount of $385,000. City Clerk. Please say yes or no when I call your name. Councilmember Zorns? Yes. Mayor Thompson? Yes. Councilmember Alderks? Yes. Councilmember Mankey? Yes. Deputy Mayor Alcabra? Yes. Passes 5 0. We have Councilmember McNeil absent and excused. Thank you. Thank you. All right, next up, we have Agenda Bill. 
22-129, the second quarter of 2022 budget status report. City Manager. Absolutely, Mayor, and I, I want to do a quick time check and make sure we're good. Okay. We're good. Very good. Um, well, the next presenter needs no introduction. She uh, <laughs> had a whole proclamation, but um, I will uh, indulge the opportunity to introduce her anyway. And just note that um, you know, there was a lot of thanks to Maureen for extending her retirement. And um, I will say appropriately that here tonight we're going to be hearing uh, the regular second quarter uh, budget status report from her. And um, this week will also be like my quarter of being on the job. So I'm extremely grateful that um, if, if Maureen hadn't extended, I wouldn't have gotten to work with her. And it's uh, it's been an honor. And um, I can think of no better uh, leader to help navigate through my first budget process here in the city of Bothell. And so we'll be talking a little bit more about that in, the, in a minute. But for now, I'm going to turn it over to Maureen to hit a few highlights from what we saw in the second quarter. And Maureen will be here. It's uh, information only, but happy to answer questions and follow up as needed. So Maureen, I'll turn it over to you. Well, thank you, <coughs> city manager. Um, knowing that this is um, a packed agenda tonight and knowing also that there wasn't a whole lot of change in um, what I saw between the first quarter and the second quarter, it's going to be a brief report brief report for you tonight. Um, you'll hear a lot more about finance stuff as we get into the uh, capital facilities plan agenda item. Uh, so with that, second quarter, we always are looking at economic forecast and trends. And one of our main revenue streams, which happens to be sales tax, we're always keeping a close eye on that. And that always comes two months uh, later as a lag from the Department of Revenue. So uh, any of the second quarter, we always look to see how our residents and um, their spending habits um, moving forward. And sales tax for the second quarter came in at 6.3% over uh, of an increase over quarter one. Now of the sales tax, the retail sales portion was relatively flat, not a whole lot of, of change in that. But construction sales tax, um, between the first and second quarter came in at 20% uh, increase. Then another major revenue stream, which is our utility taxes overall, was 10.4% increase from quarter one. Uh, much of that was between um, electricity and gas and a little bit of gambling tax. Uh, so we are continuing to see some increases in those types of utility taxes and then, as we've mentioned in previous quarters, uh, quarterly reports, uh, telephone and cell tax uh, continues to lag behind. Another major revenue stream is our revenues that we receive from development. That includes development review fees, uh, pre-application fees, and of course, all the permits. And if you look overall between uh, comparing second quarter of this year to 2021, we have a 120% increase. Um, that just kind of confirms all the construction and building that's going on in our city. Then this is just uh, a graph of our citywide, all of the funds in the city, um, a comparison between the revenues and expenditures for this quarter. And as you can see, the, the revenues, the money coming in uh, exceeded our, our spending, our, our expenditures for this quarter. Um, citywide was about $43 uh, million in um, the revenue side as compared to the expenditures, the difference there. Similar to the general fund with about an $8 million difference where revenues exceeded um, the expenditures over this quarter. So as I, I said, as I started this brief presentation, the economic um, trends wasn't a whole lot different from first quarter. We do know in the second quarter, you know, inflation was a big topic. Uh, cost of living increase, our CPIW that uh, uh, many of our um, union contracts are based upon came in in June at 9.5%. We also had uh, an increase of 11.8% overall inflation rate for the Puget Sound re region. A couple of more positive notes in our region, we also see 
job growth uh, increased 5.6%, and we have a low unemployment rate that dropped to 3.4%. So as I've stated, we are continually watching trends, economic uh, forecasters in this region and nationwide to uh, see and make sure that we are alerted to anything that may cause us concern. And then something I've always kind of wanted to mention is what I call noteworthy items. We have completed our 21 annual com comprehensive financial plan or report, which has been audited by the state auditor's office. And you can find the complete report on the city website under the finance page. There are two sections of that that I just want to draw to your attention. While not many people really find joy in reviewing or looking at financial statements, there are two sections that might be worthy to uh, the readers, and that is the notes to the financial statements and the statistical section. Uh, the notes you will find in the middle of the report, and it is a narrative of many different items. You, it will talk about our debt, the city's investments, our liabilities, the um, um, property tax, and our budget process, and construction commitments. So there's a lot of uh, information in that section which readers might find useful. And then the other section I'd like to draw your attention to is at the very end of the report. It's called the statistical section, and it has a 10-year history. There is a 10-year history of all of our sales tax for the last 10 years, uh, our property tax levy rates, our property assessed values for the last 10 years, and our uh, general fund fund balance history. So I just wanted to point those two sections out for those uh, readers who might be interested in some of that data. Um, I know we have some council members that like data, so just want to point that out. And with that, I will turn it back over to mayor and council and answer any questions you may have. Council Member Mankey. Thank you, Mayor, and thanks, Mo, again for um, putting all this together and uh, leaving with a good update. I just had one question around the gambling taxes. I saw that they were up, you said 48%. I'm curious, where do those taxes come from? Do they come from the lottery or scratch tickets, other places? Y yes, um, all of the above. And, and pull tabs, we have, we have a couple of pull tabs. Okay. Yeah, so they came in higher. Do you know, um, do we collect taxes from things like online sports betting, which is on the rise, heavily on the rise, FanDuel, um, MGM, they're all starting up these electronic sports betting um, franchises and, and battling over customers at this point, which is, it's an interesting place to be, I think. I, I just wasn't sure if the state yeah. had captured that yet or if it's still you know being debated. Yeah, Council Member Mankey, I'm no expert on sports gambling, but um, moving from a state that did allow it, I do not believe that Washington State actually does allow online sports gambling yet, and so I think that's a revenue stream that we're not seeing, um, and that's always a legislative action away. Good to know. Thank you. Councilmember Aldricks. I'm not trying to answer for you, Maureen, um, but I do know somebody you should talk to about that in the state legislature, and that would be our representative, Shelley Kloba. She's on that committee, and um, those are conversations that she's having. So if you also would like to bring that up with our uh, lobbyists, um, that might be another place to put it in, uh, because you're right, it is, it is a potential form of sales tax that could come back to the city that would then impact our budget um, and our finances. So. That's one thing I can say about that. I believe Rep Club is the chair of Commerce and Gaming of that committee. Anybody else have any questions for Mo? All right, I just have a couple things. Um, the development revenues up 120%, how much of that is do you think just like general growth and how much of that is a couple of pretty large projects that we have going on right now? Well, the community development could <clears throat> direct or deputy director could probably answer that better yeah. or it, cause I, just from what I've seen, I think we do have some large projects that that comes in. However, I noticed that the development review fees were, were down slightly from the first quarter, but it was all the building permits and all the different types of permits that had really increased. Um, so 
So do you have anything to add? Yeah, I think we can provide a follow-up with more detail on okay. that. Um, our interim community development director is uh, leaving leaving town, and I think uh, has the night off tonight. But we'll we'll pull to some information together for that. Really, what I'm getting at and what I'm interested in is like whenever I see an uptick like this, and we've obviously gotten a decent amount more revenue than we predicted coming into the year. How sustainable is that? I remember when we did the budget, you know, a couple of years ago, everything was pretty in flux. We didn't know what was going to happen. Um, so I guess I'm just wondering, is this something that we could consider normal moving forward? Or is this something that we should be thankful for this year and then maybe not? Uh, it, it is, we know, we, we always say we budget conservatively. So this, this is good, what we are seeing coming in. You will see more in our projections during the budget uh, development and the, the, the budget study sessions. We may even, we still may be conservative in some of those um, development review fees. But we do have some large projects, so as city manager standard said, we can pro we'll probably get some more information for you as, on those. as part of the budget conversations is fine it's not something that I need before then yeah. um, I'm mostly just curious because I look there and I see a roughly 10 percent overage heading into a budget season with roughly 10 percent inflation and pushing 90 percent of our budget is staff and um, that makes me feel really optimistic that the budget conversations might not be too dire <laughs> I don't want to get too optimistic um, and that's it. Um, that's all I've got. But thank you um, so much for the presentation and for all the other things that we thank you for earlier. Thank you. All right. Next up, we have a study session, two study sessions. The first one is Agenda Bill 22130, Regional Mobile Crisis Response, um, the Radar Navigator Merger and Expansion. Um, but before we do that, um, we're going to take a 10 minute break. Recording stopped.
All right, welcome back. Um, next up, we have Agenda Bill 22130, the Regional Mobile Crisis Response, the Radar Navigator Merger and Expansion. City Manager. Yeah, Mayor, as you said right before the break, this is the first of two study sessions. So both of these are really for the purpose of giving council an update and gathering input uh, from the council on where to go next. Uh, as, as you're aware, and by way of background, the regional mobile crisis response is in fact a regional effort. And um, if you compare notes across um, several of our neighboring jurisdictions, there's several councils getting updates this week. Um, so for here in Bothell, I'm pleased to introduce our interim assistant city manager, Becky Range. And then um, she will have some an, uh, other folks online to help answer questions too as needed. But for the presentation, I'm going to turn things over to Becky. Thank you so much for your time tonight, Mayor and Council Members. Um, we have a very exciting and positive topic to discuss tonight. And as he did mention, just a reminder, we're not taking any action. Uh, we're really just here to discuss this collaborative effort and to hear any questions that you might have about the ILA and to answer any concerns that you might have. Um, I would like to note that I joined this effort late, and so I don't want to take credit for a lot of the great work that's already been done on this project. And so we have a couple of people that are in our audience today that will be able to explain things if we have any questions, and that really do deserve a lot of credit for the work that's been done thus far. Uh, Brooke Butner, of course, our radar manager, is on with us tonight. And also Karen Reed, who I believe um, many of you have already met. Uh, Karen Reed is the consultant who's been leading this five city effort. And she's done an amazing job. I, th I think you can imagine the challenges of getting five cities to agree on anything and to move through such an important ILA and such an important government entity. And she's done just simply a wonderful job on that. And then of course, I also have to my left, uh, Chief Suberlick who was very instrumental in the radar expansion program into Bothell. So just real quickly tonight, we will uh, do an overview of the original radar navigator program. I know most of you are well aware of how successful that program is, but for anyone who's watching tonight that might not be aware, we'll just do a quick overview of the program. Uh, we'll talk about the merger and expansion of the radar navigator program uh, across these five cities. Uh, we will hit the highlights of the regional entity and the ILA. That is why we're having this discussion tonight is because eventually we need to get your approval on that ILA. We'll talk about the draft budget for such an important regional project and then we'll go over some next steps. Just a quick reminder, we have lots of regional collaborative efforts that are in the works right now. And so when we talk about our behavioral health services, we've been talking a lot about a continuum of services. And so you will hear this theme often in multiple areas. Um, it's very important for a community member in crisis to have someone to call. And we have this new 988 line that all the different cities are preparing for and adjusting to. But it's important to have someone to call if you're experiencing a crisis but then you also may need someone to respond. And that's what we're talking about tonight, is this uh, radar navigator program having a mental health professional that can actually respond with first responders side by side with them to provide assistance. And then we'll also talk a little bit more about some place to go. And there's also a regional collaborative effort to site a clinic uh, crisis center in our area. So these are three really exciting aspects and that we are all moving forward on, but also big body of work for all these cities. So we appreciate your support in each of these areas. So just a few uh, highlights of the original Radar Navigator program. You're probably aware it did start in Shoreline. It expanded to Bothell and other cities. Um, I believe it started in 2017. When it expanded to our area, we also actually took on the administering agency portion of the radar program. And so we were lucky enough to have those radar navigators and the managers as City of Bothell employees. Um, in the last few years, the program has been incredibly successful. And I think many of you have heard about that, you know about that. The five cities of Bothell, Kirkland, Kenmore, Lake Forest Park, and Shoreline 
have worked very closely. Um, there's been collaborative efforts on grant funding to just how the navigators work with our different first responders. It's been pretty wonderful. Um, so right now, the Radar Navigator program, what they do is they provide community members in crisis with some pretty important services. Um, when someone has a mental health crisis or a substance use crisis or perhaps they're even suicidal, it's an incredibly difficult and challenging situation. And the navigators help give them the behavioral health crisis support they need, help first responders with de-escalation. And if you hear Brooke talk about it, she explains it very, very eloquently that they navigate people from this time of crisis to the services and treatment that they actually need. Um, they also enhanced community and first responder mm -hmm. safety uh, by helping uh, de-escalate a crisis situation and really reducing the potential of a use of uh, physical force, which is very important to all of us. Um, also, it's a program that's helped strengthen community and police partnerships. Just recently, um, the King County MID program, uh, the MID program is a, a grant uh, funding stream for this program. They released some outcomes for the Radar Navigator program. And we all knew that the Radar Navigator program was very successful, but we got some really interesting outcomes, very positive. Um, for people that were touched by the services, there's a 67% reduction in adult jail bookings, 60% reduction in crisis services events, and 14% of those individuals uh, were enrolled in publicly funded outpatient um, health services. So just a quick uh, high level look at the current radar navigator program. So you see there's five positions. They're not always funded or they're not always filled, um, but a pretty small but mighty group um, of course, we have the program manager, and that's Brooke. Uh, we do at the City of Bothell have one navigator position that's already in our budget as part of your public safety levy. There's also two navigator positions full-time that are funded again by the mid-grants from King County and one contractor uh, from WASPIC. So as successful as this program is, we all know that there's probably other ways and better ways that we can serve our community members who are in crisis. And so a team of very talented and dedicated staff from these five cities, and I would like to say, I don't think Aaron Linhart's name is on that list, mm -hmm. but in the beginning, Aaron was our representative for this collaborative group, and she was very instrumental in getting us to where we are today. But this group of city administrators and assistant city administrators have been working for several months um, with Karen Reed as a consultant to put together this roadmap for how do you combine this na navigator program with a Kirkland co-responder program that was also already in the works, and how do you put the foundation together for an entity that makes sense, that it gives all the five cities equal um, power and influence and decision making. And, and that is really no easy task. Um, so this group of people really need to be commended. So there were a couple of reasons why this group met and started thinking about how to improve this program and expand coverage. Um, much of it was city councils were asking for expanded coverage. All of our cities um, would like to invest in mental health services. So we knew that the current coverage um, is probably just not quite enough. But the city started working together also knowing that the 988 line would be coming on and we really needed to plan for how those uh, calls are dispatched. Um, I mentioned this earlier, there was also this notion that the Kirkland Community Responder Program exists, but if we could combine all the city programs together and have it all operating in the same way, there's some real efficiencies there. Um, it, it's easier to recruit uh, mental health providers. There's just so, there's so much value from combining the programs. Um, and also, uh, something that we've all been talking about is this crisis stabilization facility. There's a real nexus between if you put all your navigator program together, then you'll also have better service and integration when, if someone unfortunately has to go to a crisis clinic. So it really just made a lot of sense. 
So here's the exciting slide. So what can you do when you work together with your regional neighbors and your city partners? So if you combine your funding and your, your employment structure and pool your resources, you can have much more coverage than what you originally had. So if you remember before, we had about five positions. So this group, as they envision new models and think about staffing, they are tentatively planning for a model that has 13 employees, 13 individuals. And right now, we, we really wanted to move towards 24-7 coverage. That's the goal, perhaps, but that's, it's going to be hard to get there. But right now, the model is based on uh, an average of 16 hours a day and seven days a week of scheduled coverage, but then also having some on-call or call-out practices so that we can meet more needs um, as crisis happen. So a little bit more about the model itself, and I know Brooke could absolutely answer more questions about this in detail, but of course that, as I mentioned, that new model does stretch and share resources. Um, some of the navigators would be paired together. Uh, navigators and mental health professionals could potentially respond without other first responders when deemed safe to do so. And another thing we talked about is that there are lots of things happening when a crisis is happening and first responders are acting, law enforcement's acting. Um, we talked a lot about how if we do this properly with the merger and expansion, that your mental health professionals can take the lead on a call if able, and that helps share resources or frees up resources uh, for other things that might be happening. And then as I mentioned before, you know, the power of five cities coming together, we've already seen this. As we talk about some of the challenges um, that we face trying to hire mental health professionals, you know, there's some challenges with insurance requirements. And when five cities get together and ask for new legislation or new changes in insurance coverage, we're a little bit, um, we'll probably be a little bit more powerful in that ask. Also, it helps a little bit with recruiting as we put all those employees together. So throughout this process and these five cities were working together, we had a lot of discussion about the regional entity and this uh, future ILA. And I just, I cannot commend Karen Reed enough. We went through several models. We studied many, many different entities that could potentially be this new agency. And, and there's a wide variety of things all across the region. And the group, and you see in the packet, they actually recommended that we use a nonprofit model. And what happens is that nonprofit will, well, let me back up. So City of Kirkland will actually be taking over as the fiscal agent and the administering agent of the program. They will loan the employees to the nonprofit. And the nonprofit is a great kind of structural way to ensure that each of the five cities have equal authority in the decision-making process. And it's just a very clean entity for a million different reasons that Karen can also answer if you have any questions about that. Um, some of the key provisions of this ILA that we've been working through and that eventually we'll ask for you to approve, uh, we worked through the agency goals, what the structure of the agency would be, how the services would be provided, but I will say the governance structure is a really important piece of this ILA because this group recognizes and understands that the ILA and the governance structure needs to be flexible enough so that we can make decisions in a wise and collaborative way down the road when we need to change this program or we need to add to it or you know, whatever we need to do to make it better. And so that these documents are your key to be able to do that. The budget was addressed, and we'll talk about that a little bit more in a minute. And of course, the fiscal agency, which will be the city of Kirkland. And also, we had a lot of discussion about weighted voting when we talk about how decisions um, are made with this new entity. So I just want to highlight a few things. There were a lot 
of topics and things that had to be ironed out um, when this group was meeting. And the governance structure, I'll be really honest with you, it was something we really had to work hard at. Uh, there are lots of different needs, um, lots of different stakeholders that we needed to take into consideration. And I think the team is pretty proud of the final recommendations. Um, there is an executive board. That executive board is made up of the five city managers or city administrators. And there's a non-voting liaison from the operations board. The advisory boards are a separate group that work with us. And that operations board is made up of your police, your fire, and dispatch, I believe. And it's multidisciplinary. There's also currently a community advisory board for the radar navigator program, which really is valuable. And so there's a lot of discussion about that and how to keep that intact. And that advisory board does have individuals with lived experiences in the crisis care system. And their feedback is so incredibly critical to the success of this program. There's also a principal's assembly, which has representatives from each of the principal's elected body, and they meet at least once per year. So of course, when you expand a program and you're delivering more services, there is a budget component. There are, I think, a lot more numbers and a fact sheet in your agenda packet, but I just wanted to show this slide. Um, as Kyle did mention earlier, all of the different cities are briefing their city councils this week. In the draft ILA, the first version, this budget model is based on, for the most part, a per capita. Um, structure. And the budget also assumes some mid-grant revenue. And we also wanted to point out that we believe if we consolidate efforts, there will also be potentially much more grant opportunities moving forward. But we just don't really know that right now. So we're working with the data we have right now. And so there are some one-time costs. There are ongoing costs. And if you look at that second column from the right, your budget estimates for this program for 23-24 budget are about $660,000. So when we think about, you know, well, $300,000 a year, uh, we really start to look at our budget. And I want to remind you again, our Bothell budget already includes one public safety levy position. And so that $164,000 a year is already part of our contribution. So the only remaining part for our contribution would be about $200,000 per year. So we had a lot of internal staff meetings about this budget item, and we recommend that this additional funding contribution also be funded with the public safety levy. And so again, a reminder, we're going from about five employees to 13. So this is pretty amazing. So next steps, uh, we want to hear what all of our city councils think about the draft ILA and any concerns you might have. And you can even take some time to think about that because what we'd like to do is bring all of your feedback back to the planning group and to shape the next version of this ILA. And then hopefully uh, we will be able to bring the final ILA back to all of our councils in November or December for final approval and actually start this new regional expanded program in the first quarter of next year. That's all I have. I am happy to answer questions and I know that Brooke and Karen are also on the call and happy to answer questions as well. Thank you. Councilmember Aldricks. Thank you. <laughs> um, I, I do have several questions, um, but, oh, hi, Brooke. I see you now. Um, and hello, Karen. Um, it is, it's just really exciting to see this um, come together. I, I'm, I'm just very impressed by the, um, the cities and how they've worked together to, to bring this, um, to bring this proposal. And, um, Oh, I'm trying to like figure out what order do I want to ask. Um, first, I think I want to ask a question of, of Karen. 
Um, it looks like you've done a lot of work when it comes to figuring out the structure and involvement of the cities and, and how, to, um, how to create an entity going forward. And um, I'm wondering if you've looked to NUSA, it's a local organization, the North Urban Human Services Association, for a model of how, um, of how that type of an entity might work together, um, specifically around elected involvement. Um, I'm, I serve on the, the NUSA, um, well, I guess it's the Coalition on Homelessness is actually what I serve on. And, um, and that means that we're able, that there are elected officials able to come together every month around um, homelessness outreach and um, services. So mm -hmm. I'm wondering if that is something that was considered instead of a once a year meeting so that um, electeds can have more involvement and oversight. Um, it's something that we, we did look at a, a range of options for how over, oversight could happen here. I will share with you that um, some of the elected officials at the Kirkland City Council earlier this evening spoke to their desire to see that the principal's assembly met more frequently than once a year. So that is something we can definitely take back to the group and, and talk about that issue. Great, thank you. Um, and then this is maybe for Karen, maybe for Brooke. Um, when I see in the agenda that um, for this to be a 24-7 program, it needs 13 staff. Is that 13 staff or is that 13 navigators? Um, I think I can clarify that the 13 staff uh, that we're looking at right now is including program manager, supervisor, and admin. And it doesn't actually get to 24-hour coverage. It gets to two-shift coverage with an on-call support for the other, for the overnight hours. Okay, thank you. Um, and that's what I was trying to understand. Uh, because if there, um, I'd love to hear more about that on-call component. Because I absolutely see how, you know, you can have people called from their beds. I'm I work in on-call work. I know how it works. It's totally fine uh, for that to be the agreement that we have with uh, contractors or, or um, staff. And so I'm just wondering, um, is there a plan at some point to get it to full 24-7? Um, or would we just kind of see how this on-call thing goes and, and see if we want to keep it that way? I, I'd just kind of love to hear your thoughts on that. You want me to take a, oh, Brooke, you're on. I'll, I'll start and Brooke can back up. Okay. Yeah, um, I think as we have managed, we, part of this is a balance between um, what cities are able to pay as in the startup, because this is a much, this is a significantly bigger program than any of them have been involved in to date. So it's it's stepping up to this initial threshold, figuring out what's the the best way to deploy those staff to get the maximum coverage possible provide for the on-call coverage, and then make sure that staff are appropriately compensated for, for that. And then as we go forward in time, if the cities can reach agreement on, okay, it's time we're willing to step up to more staff so that we can get closer and closer and accomplish 24 seven, that's certainly one of the goals, the stated goals is to try to get there, but financially, I don't think the group is in a position to go to that level of funding right now you know, in the next biennium. Absolutely, I understand um, that that this is a, a, a great leap forward and, and we wanna be successful at it um, before we take those next steps of, of becoming 24-7. Um, and it, the on-call component, I think, is a, is a very thoughtful way to do that. Um, so thank you for that. Um, a couple other questions is, let's talk about hiring. Um, I know one of the limitations of the mid-grant is that it very specifically stated that um, that mental health profession, master's level mental health professionals could be the only ones hired. Um, and that has actually limited our, our pool of people who are qualified to do this work. Um, when we know that people with lived experience are actually some of the, um, some of the best people to navigate this, uh, this world um, and when people are in need. So, uh, and, and Brooke has spoken to this previously, but I would just like to make it known that 
um, within the new ILA to have a little more latitude um, in, in hiring so that we can start making some equitable hiring decisions and not making sure, not requiring everybody to have gone to you know graduate school to get a master's degree and to do the whole licensing thing that there are um, a number of, of people in our communities who are qualified to do this work, maybe through peer counseling training, um, through have just you know what their lived experience is out in the world. Um, so that is that is kind of my like big request that we we don't limit ourselves to who we can hire in this next kind of funding go around. Um, and my last question is. When we're talking about getting navigators out, um, out possibly without uh, first or other first responders, it says when deemed necessary. And so I'd love to just have some clarification on what, it, what criteria is used to determine that it is safe to do that. I can speak to that and then everybody that has been in the negotiations, please jump in if I miss something. But I think that is kind of TBD at this point, council member. Um, there are no protocols in place at this time to, to that speak to what is considered a safe situation for a 911 call. So that's part of the early work of this entity is defining that um, in uh, cooperation with police, with fire and with our dispatch partners. I think you said an operative phrase there, which is in partnership with 911. And my question then back to you would be, how do we get navigators dispatched through the 988 service? Where the, um, for example, the, the mobile crisis unit can be dispatched from 988 crisis connections. So then how then do we get navigators connected to that dispatch process as well so that it's not having to go through 911? Yeah, that's such a good question. Oh boy, I'm getting some feedback, sorry about that. Um, that horizon, they call them development horizons in the 988 um, rollout, and that horizon is a few years away, and I 100% I see the Radar Navigator Program or the new entity as a big part of that conversation, not only as one of the responding bodies, but as it's an, uh, potentially a fundee from the state funding that's coming through 988 legislation. And I think it's gonna be really important for us to partner with our electeds on that because um, it has been such a political issue. Um, at the state level. So I look forward to partnering with this council and with the other councils to ensure that North King County is included in those conversations and that we are one of the entities that is dispatched when they have that capability in 2023, 2024 and beyond. I love that you threw dates in there because you say that it's a horizon and that could be years away, but 2023 and 2024 is really just around the corner. So uh, that's it. well, that's optimistic. That's the, <laughs> that, that's the 988 horizon um, that the Chris committee is talking about, but I think that's optimistic. So we, we, we will all be working together as a system. Well, I know that there are members of our community who are hungry for that to happen. Um, and so I, I wish that, that group um, all the best in being able to bring that forward sooner than later. Thank you. Thanks uh, for answering all my questions. That, that's the end of what I've got and I will pass it over to my other council members. Council Member Zorns. Well, first I wanna thank our um, chiefs. I think this started with Carol Cummings and um, our current chief, Chief Sub, picking up the ball on this. It's an important program. And then Becky and Aaron, the coordinating of um, so much for networking with the cities, but also pulling council in on seeing what was being done around the country was very, very helpful. Um, brains at the table, I just appreciate all the mental sweat that you've put into it. Karen, it's good to see you again. It's been a while. Um, and Brooke, it's good to see you as well. I have a couple of um, just questions slash comments. Um, uh, one is involving elect electeds. I know that there's a problem of putting too many cooks in the kitchen, but um, I think electeds will pitch a fit if we don't get a ha have a chance to be uh, involved in this and 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 see what's going on. Um, but but I don't want I I don't my request also is understanding. I don't want to hamper the process of the work that you're doing as well in putting this together. Uh, also, I noticed that 
57 people in Bothell were served by navigators. It would be great, you know, as this program unrolls to, uh, or rolls out to see how the different cities are being served. And I'm sure that's going to be part of the discussion of uh, per capita versus versus demand, how, how cities weigh in and, and um, pull their share of the funding on this. And then the mid grant, I'm very grateful for that for it being there. But every time we talk about uh, a program that's funded by grants, it gives me pause because it's a little tenuous. But one in government isn't tenuous. So, any rate, I just had to make that comment. Uh, and I think my only request is data on who served across these cities. I don't think. It looks like we've covered a lot of territory with these cities, and if anyone is entertaining bringing another city in, I would say, mm, no, you've probably got your plate full on this one. So, for especially for how many mental health providers are we having? Ten. So they're they're going to have their work cut out for them. But but thank you, thank you for all the work you've done, and I'm looking forward to the next next steps on this. May I have our quick point of clarification, Council Member Zorns, I think you might have quarterly data because we serve closer to um, the 100 range for annual um, or, or were in previous years in terms of individuals in Bothell, and I can absolutely get data to the Council about um, how many folks are served in each of okay. the five radar cities okay. uh, in previous years. That's perfect. Thank you very much. Deputy Mayor. Thank you, Mayor, and thank you, uh, uh, thank you, Becky, Chief, Chiefs, everybody, all the staff, Aaron, and uh, hopefully soon Kyle also. I have to give you a shout out. Uh, uh, <laughs> Maybe he'll do something someday. <laughs> <laughs> no, thank you all. This is very. This is a really cool program, and uh, I'm really glad to see it expand so quickly to the scale. I was hoping we'll expand it even further, but I see the, I, I heard the limit. I had the same question about why 16 hours a day, but uh, thank you for answering that question. Um, I wanted to confirm this program, since we're Bothell and we're split between two counties, this also covers Snohomish County. Is that correct? Yes. Yes. Well, Snohomish County is not a party to the agreement. The services would be targeted to inside the jurisdictional boundaries of the five partner cities who are funding it. But it is possible in the future that additional cities could join. Um, and we've also made it possible with the approval of the city councils to add a non-city uh, as, a, as a principal, either Snohomish or King County or a fire district or something to that effect. Th that's a possibility for the future that's contemplated. Cool, but the city of Bothell is also in Snohomish, so if, if an incident happened in the city, okay, cool. Yeah, yeah. we're currently covering all city of Bothell residents regardless of county and would continue right. to do so. Okay, cool. Yeah. And just a quick note to um, your comment, Council Member, about the 16 hours. That was a very data-driven decision based on um, clearing code data and when we had the majority of related call for service types. So um, what might be a clearing code of mental emotional or folks that are living homeless. In some cities, they have a uh, breakdown to the point of like um, data about uh, drug calls or substance abuse calls. And so we really, the staff of the five cities really drilled into call types by hour, by day of the week to uh, do data-driven decision-making on staffing. Music to my ears and I'm sure Ben's. <laughs> Thank you. Um, uh, you. There's something about insurance. I read it in the packet, but it wasn't clear and, and it was briefly you know, mentioned in the presentation. The, uh, uh, where are we in the process and how likely, because I, I understand that there has to be some changes to the city insurance and all that, like can you provide more information about that and where we are in the process and the likelihood of it actually changing in our favor? Karen, do you want to take that? I can, I can take a, a whack at it. Right now, WCIA does not extend coverage to the navigator positions anywhere in the state. 
but um, they have sort of been deluged with requests from not only the five cities, but any number of other cities who were doing programs like this or programs involving homelessness outreach. Um, uh, WCAA's concern, as I understand it, has been that it could, you could potentially be concerned that someone had provided medical care and they don't typically provide any insurance for medical care services, um, but we are trying not to provide medical care. Mm. Um, and so the WCAA board is going to be taking up a policy change that would extend coverage. They're going to be taking that up this fall. We obviously don't know what they're going to decide, but there's they have been, um, they've been hearing from a lot of folks about um, their desire for a policy change like this. In the meantime, or if WCAA does not extend the coverage here, uh, what Kirkland is doing and what is a requirement in this um, ILA as it's drafted right now would be that anybody that's going out to the field needs to have insurance coverage that addresses their liability for anything they do and also extends to their employer and yourselves by extension beyond that. And that coverage is available for licensed mental health professionals and it can be secured on the private market and so the, the individual that's hired would acquire the insurance and then the agency would pay them that, re they would cover that cost for them. Mm. Oh, okay, so there is a workaround until the, the agency approves. Uh, okay, cool, thank you. A uh, question about the uh, structure, I, uh, I, I, when I read, I mean, I'm not a legal expert in, uh, Nonprofit structures, but I assume our city attorney reviewed. Shall I assume? I guess that's a question. Is it, good, is it a good assumption? I did. I did review the agreement. Yes. And the articles of incorporation and bylaws and all that. Yes. Okay. Cool. And you, you're okay with it? Yes. Okay. If Paul is okay with it, I'm okay with it. Um, I uh, like I, I second the uh, principal assembly for the electeds more than once a year or a triple, I guess. And this other cities are mentioning it, so I, I don't know, 10x. Um, we mentioned funding uh, that comes from the public safety levy. Uh, what's the opportunity cost of that money? What could we have used it? What else could we have used it for? I can take that. Um, as we all know, the public safety levy was a voter approved measure. And so it is, it's a little bit of a complicated question to answer, but the public safety levy that our community voted for is to cover public safety. Um, there are lots of different areas in the ballot measure language um, that do call out certain positions. The mental health navigator position was a position that was approved. Um, it's, it's a complicated question, uh, but we can provide you with more information on the exact specifics on that language, on what that can be spent on. But I will say, um, when we talk about the levy funds and how they could or should be spent, we often say, well, legally, can we spend them a certain way? Financially, are we allowed to do that? But the third measure of criteria for us that's very, very important is what was the spirit and intent of that levy when it was passed by our community? And do we feel like the expenditures meet that voter expectation and that voter promise? And so a team of us, we dig into that voter ballot measure language. We also look at any campaign materials that were provided. Um, but yeah, public safety in general, it's a pretty flexible um, fund. No, no, it's, uh, I, I understand. I was saying, I don't know if there's a list of initiatives that would have been covered and we picked this one or one of the few initiatives. Are we going to be using up the whole thing? Are we not going to, uh, leaving initiatives on the table because we don't have funding for them? And that's the no, question. and I don't know if Mo wants to correct me, but I do believe that we have a, a levy fund balance that's pretty high. And I don't think that there are other initiatives that wouldn't be funded at this point in time. I believe currently there's around six million in that fund. Oh, maybe we should go to 24 hour service. Okay, I'm good, thank you. Councilmember Mankey. 
Thank you, Mayor. Um, thanks to all the presenters as well. This was great information. Uh, first, a foundational question. Are there any other cities in the state that have embarked upon something like this before? Or are we the first, you know, kind of trailblazing this for everybody else? I'm not aware of this type of collaboration, but Karen, I don't know if you're aware of any others. I mean, not, not doing mobile crisis response. I know a number of cities are doing it, um, but they're doing it solo. I don't know anyone that's doing it um, band banding together with their peers. Okay, great. I, just for the record, I think that working together as a region is the way to go. It's more cost effective. It is, um, serves more people and allows us to get more coverage. So I definitely think um, this is the right model. I'm hoping the data proves it once we get more, but um, I, am, I am supportive just looking at it from right now. Uh, second question, the 2025-2026 budget is about 33% higher than the 2023-2024 budget. Is that due to program expansion or is it higher because um, we're shifting to the per capita model? It's um, not, does not reflect an increase in FTEs. I think the increase that you're looking at in Bothell is primarily um, you're moving to the per capita model and the, in the initial biennium, Kirkland is picking up the lion's share of the staffing costs and that they're paying for an additional three and a half FTEs on their own plus their per capita share of the operating costs. Um, but the, the group felt strongly that every after that, that was a great, uh, wonderful thing for Kirkland to offer, but people were like, well, going forward, we all need to be prepared to share share this on an uh, equal basis. So the second biennium, everyone would be participating uh, with a share of the uh, their budget based on the on per, cap, on per capita population. Okay, that makes sense to me. Um, is there any opportunity to obtain additional funding from King County? I was just reading a news article, I think it was a couple days ago, where the county executive announced that he was going to be budgeting a lot of money for um, people in crisis, expanding behavioral health. Is there any opportunity for us there to, um, to go to um, the county that we're all sitting in currently and, and ask for additional funds? We believe there are many opportunities. In fact, I believe Brooke is attending a webinar tomorrow to learn about just such uh, one of those grant funding opportunities, and it's well over a million dollars, I believe. And that's at the state level, but I think there are a number of opportunities with our King County partners. Um, staff at Shoreline is working on a letter right now to uh, be signed, I think, at the next round of council meetings by uh, probably by mayors to go to King County requesting additional funding um, either from the mid or potentially from other funding sources. And I um, saw the same press release and, and thought this is the kind of work that, that the executive is talking about. So I appreciate that, Council Member Minky. Excellent. Um, just to add one more to the, uh, the reporting back to council and, and giving us updates on how that's going and also having the executive team meeting more often than once a year. I think, especially as we're getting going, it's gonna be really important. And as a council member, um, I think it's important for us to know what, you know, what, what type of activity we're seeing, what type of volumes, what kind of impact the program is having so that we can then speak to it positively in the community and share those things with, with our neighbors and those that we talk to at uh, Coffee with the Cop and, and other um, activities around towns, the summer nights, things like that. I guess two, um, two comments to wrap up my, my thoughts. I, I have done some ride-alongs with the, uh, the police department and have spoken with officers and, and firefighters that have co-responded. They have all spoken highly of the radar program. So that was really positive to hear. Uh, they had nothing good, good things to say about the radar program. Um, and I know that mental health is on the decline in our society, unfortunately. We're probably at the lowest point we've been at in the last decade. Um, and I don't think any of us are expecting it for it to get any better anytime soon. Um, at least in the near term, it's probably going to get worse. So. I love that we are working on this now. We're being proactive with it. We're growing the program as we need, and we're, we're finding creative ways to expand coverage um, at this time. So thank you again for all the work that you're all doing. It's valuable work. I think we're going to see some, um, some good things in our community coming out of this, and I am supportive of this. It's my turn. Um, I have a list. This is going to be super fast. Um, but first, I just want to start off by saying thank you to everyone on staff that's touched this. 
you know, this is something that we were kind of rattling the cages and yelling about, and you guys just, like, ran with it and brought us back something that's really cool. And thank you. Um, that is a really big deal because I know we're, you know, we're going to say thank you, and I'm going to ask for more things now, but I just want to stop and say thank you before I ask for more things so you know that I really do appreciate and take note of how, like, this was just a lot of initiative on the staff side. So thank you. Um, and also that um, when we talk about some of the yet to be defined parts of this, um, uh, that earns a lot of trust with me. When we go forward and we still have decisions that we need to make, I, I, I really appreciate the work you've done so far. To my list. Um, have we talked about doing anything with dispatch? in terms of mental health training. I know Councilmember Alders had the question about how do we decide who to send and what, and I feel like having people with that mental health expertise in dispatch making those decisions and able to give care faster um, could be good. It's a great point, Mayor. There had been a lot of discussions with the planning group about dispatch and uh, just at the, the foundational level, ensuring that dispatch is included in all of the conversations that we're having because they're such an integral part. Um, there were also some learnings that the city of Kirkland uh, brought back from them on a visit to Arizona where they were able, they were actually going to visit um, the crisis clinic, but they learned a lot about uh, dispatch and uh, uh, having mental health providers co-located with dispatch and actually participating in that side by side with dispatch. And so that's something we're exploring. Awesome. That's really great. Um, a couple things on the ILA. Um, in section four and goal B, I would love to see language in there um, stating that one of the goals is to reduce overall police response. And I think that slide at the beginning that talked about outcomes um, was pretty impressive in terms of the uh, rate that people weren't seen after they were seen by one of our navigators. Um, one more piece of feedback um, in section nine, um, when talking about the advisory groups um, and the operational advisory group, um, just about every category in there was, you know, not less than one or no less than one of a certain part. And then with the police chiefs, it was all of the police chiefs. Um, I would love to see just the same language used there, um, simply so this doesn't look in our community like something that is really dominated by the police department. Not saying that there shouldn't be police there, but I, I would like to see that language the same for police chiefs, fire chiefs, all of the people involved. Oh, throughout the ILA, it refers to persons with apparent behavioral health issues, substance abuse, and or developmental disabilities. There are a lot of people with developmental, developmental disabilities that don't need radar, and it's the people with behavioral health issues that need radar regardless if they have developmental disabilities or not. Is there a particular reason that that is called out in here? I think one underlying cause is that developmental disability was called out in our original mid funding. And that was uh, to a certain extent driven by the fact that the city of Shoreline as the founding city um, had a focus on folks with developmental disabilities who fell into crisis and had a large number of individuals with developmental disabilities having contact with police. Um, and um, Mayor, that question came up at the Kirkland City Council as well, so I think we probably kind of need to go back to the drawing board and just have a conversation about the language around behavioral health um, and, and the folks that are uh, included uh, by name. I will say from the perspective of our community advisory board, which is folks that have lived experience um, having uh, crisis situations with themselves or with their families, that they actually want to move toward just people in crisis without defining it as mental health or substance use or any type of diagnosis, um, that they feel like anyone can fall into crisis without a history of diagnosis and they want to keep it more broad. So there are a lot of, um, a lot of thoughts and feelings around how we define it. So I think your, your comment is really um, well taken. I love the idea of just people in crisis because that's ultimately who we're looking to serve here. Um, and yes. Um, I would love 
to have a better name than CMCR. And I know I chatted with the assistant city manager about this earlier, and I know this has been a subject that's uh, come up a lot, and there's been a lot of brainstorming, but like something you could just say would be phenomenal. I don't know if there's any more plans for that, but. We'll definitely take that back to the planning group. I, I think we've heard some feedback. We've all been working on a name and found it a little bit more challenging than we expected. So thank you, great feedback. All right, inside of the actual goals listed in the ILA, I would also love, like, are, is there a way we can make these measurable? Like, I feel like the, the executive director we hire and as the, you know, electeds get involved, however often we do, um, I feel like I'd love to have objective measures to compare it to and like something we're shooting for. And then at the very least, something we can baseline in the early years and compare to. Has, has that been a topic of conversation? I, I think that in terms of the ILA, I would probably recommend, again, something quite that specific, but there's definitely been a lot of talk about making sure that as we move forward that there are specific metrics that the and a lot of data collection by the agency staff and reporting on that data. So I, my anticipation is that the one of the first things that the, the staff and the board will be doing is coming up on some of their addition with their additional targets and metrics and data collection points. So I think data collection and that point is definitely in the ILA, but it, this is kind of a nascent field. So exactly where we're going, I you know, and what new additional measures would will end up being really important in a bit. We, we're not entirely sure, so we want to just know that we're all generally pointing in the mm -hmm. same direction and then leave it to the executive board to get some specific targets and metrics in mind. Perfect. And at the very least, just, you know, figure out what we're measuring in the first couple of years, even if we don't have targets, like what specifically are we trying to find out that we're having an impact on? That makes a lot of sense, though, in terms of the sequence. Thank you, Karen. Mm -hmm. um, if more jurisdictions join, if this expands in the future, um, and we're doing this on a per capita basis, presumably just depending on the size of that jurisdiction, they would bring more resources and more navigators, correct? Yes. So it seems like, I mean, if, we're, if we've got five cities and we're able to be much more efficient because we're all working together, if we added cities down the road, wouldn't that simply add to the efficiency? I think it may be a little early to tell. I think one of the, the concerns we've heard from some others is don't start inviting people into the tent unless we can be sure the service levels will not decline. That makes sense. Um, as a result of them joining, and that, that makes good sense. Um, and, I, I, and also we don't want somebody else joining to increase the financial burden on the existing principal. So those are sort of the policy goals around um, the thinking about whether or not to bring in a new principal. I'm not sure if I'm answering your question, though. No, you, you, you explained what I was getting at very well and looking for. Um, I'm not sure if you answered the question, but it's what I needed to hear. So thank you. <laughs> um, the, um, I would just echo the principals meeting more often, especially earlier in the program. You know, when this is just getting off the ground and getting everybody comfortable and introduced to it. And I think there's a lot of enthusiasm on our respective city councils for this. I don't think that would mm -hmm. be a, a tough ask um, mm -hmm. to get people together. Um, and I really enjoyed um, Councilmember Aldrich's comments on qualifications. Um, I thought that made a ton of sense. Like ultimately we want people that can do the job. And if that person has a bachelor's degree instead of a master's degree, that's fine with me. And that's all I've got. Thank you. This is super exciting. Um, this is a really, you know, fun thing to hear about at eight o'clock at night. Thank you for all your work on this. Thank you. All right. I think we're going to move on to our next agenda bill. All right. So this will be the the second of the two um, study sessions, and again, that's a it's a pretty significant evening of some some big updates. Um, so tonight, before council, you're going to have an opportunity to weigh in and collectively share feedback on the capital facilities plan, plan recommendations. This really does serve as we are shifting into officially budget season. And I just want to, in framing, and I, I, Gretchen may touch on this as well, 
But you will see the results of tonight's conversation. Number one, it's coming back in October, on October 4th, and there will be a public hearing, and council looking, will be looking at that time for approval of the plan. That plan then gets incorporated into the overall budget, the biennial budget. And so you'll see you'll see this again, too. There's um, Again, we want to have this as a foundational setting, though, um, for that budget and to really inform the budget. And then from there, we really start kicking off. So after October 4th, then things get into publication mode. We'll have some briefings. You'll see the last, uh, the third week of October, we'll really start diving into the overall budget, too. And then our, our three sessions in November will be focused on the budget and, and optimistic that in one of the first two weeks of December, we'll get the budget adoption. So tonight really does start laying that path um, like a good capital facilities plan would do. Uh, we're putting down infrastructure for this budget. It's a pretty lengthy presentation tonight, so I do also just want to um, reassure council that there will be pauses in between different sections uh, for questions, so you don't have to quote, hold your questions till the very end. Um, and then also, uh, an advantage just to recognize, too, is that as we kick this off, um, we do have th three of you are, were involved in a committee along with a planning commission member and a parks board member, so a lot of opportunities for feedback along the way, and I want to say thank you to council members Zorns and Menke, you were um, along from the beginning, and then one, one thing that the mayor and I have in common is we came in uh, mid-process. There was three meetings, Gretchen will touch on that, and I think we got to both join for the last two. So um, there's we have something else in common um, to think about. So with all that being said, there's a, there's a team of eight here tonight to present to you, and uh, I'm thankful that Gretchen Zendel will be here to really facilitate that process, run the PowerPoint, and most importantly, make sure that we get to each section and can answer questions. Gretchen, if you don't know her, is our senior financial analyst over capital programs, and is, um, she will always point to this team of doing great work, but I do want to say thank you to Gretchen as well, because again, as I came in and um, started preparing for that first meeting in July, I know I had um, large eyes and lots of questions, and she didn't flinch and really delivered um, um, some some great meetings with this team, and I'm pleased to kick this off tonight with the council. So with that, I'll turn it over to Gretchen. Thank you, City Manager. Good evening, uh, Mayor and Council. Thank you for not letting us um, present the Capital Facilities Plan tonight. Okay. Um, the 2023-2029 20, Capital Facility Plans provides a forecast of funds available for capital projects and identifies all planned capital improvement projects and their estimated cost over the seven year period. The city's CFP planning process takes place in even numbered years in coordination with the budget develop development um, process. The first two years of the 2023-2029 CFP are designed to be incorporated into the city's 2023-2024 budget. The CFP committee members met three times. Their main responsibility is to evaluate and prioritize the city's capital needs for each seven-year planning period. They review the capital, the um, community engagement data, proposed projects, established project um, priorities, identified funding project sources, and made recommendations to the city council. Uh, good evening. First, apologize for getting you late a little bit. The public, um, the community engagement information, the summary we provided to you earlier this morning. For some reason, we didn't get in the packet. So we did engage a community engagement consultant, PRR, to assist us with um, this effort for their cap capital facilities plan. It consisted primarily of an online survey with an open-ended uh, comment opportunity. 
Notification was provided via postcard mailings, social media posts, e-news, and handing out flyers even at the 4th of July parade. You can see that uh, 1,500 unique visitors accessed the site, of which about 1,100 filled out the survey responses. And associated with the last question in that survey response was an open-ended opportunity, uh, which you should also have in spreadsheet form. So that was quite successful for us. In past um, capital facility plans, we did it the old way and had in-person uh, open houses where the staff typically outnumbered the public um, providing um, information to us. So it'll probably be more efficient if you have questions or on the um, actual um, engagement effort, like let's say there's something about parks that the public provided. Probably it's better to talk to Nick and Aaron when they go through the park session and they can talk about the parks. If you have a transportation outreach input that you want to clarify or see how we responded, again, talk to us during the transportation um, thing. But as a quick overview, um, the summary provides some demographic information of the respondents, what areas of the city, uh, what languages they speak, uh, ethnicity. Um, it also provides a general indi indication of the survey respondents' priorities based on how they answered each survey question. And you can see that some of the questions are oriented toward parks or transportation or utilities. And at the end of the summary, you can see a very uh, general summary of the open-ended responses with the 331 responses. And that was to a specific question of the top three priorities for capital facilities projects. And the survey basically said you can provide more information if you want to on that particular question. So that's what the spreadsheet of responses are. Our proposed projects were reviewed according to the evaluation and criteria guidelines. Is the project consistent with a plan or a program? Does it have funding? Will the project benefit many residents? Is it necessary due to public health and or safety concerns? Is it supported by the majority of the community? Is it partially funded by outside sources? Does the project generate economic benefits? Lastly, any other criteria defined by the CFP committee? The proposed um, CFP from the committee incorporated the following key elements appropriated about 4.5 million of real estate excise tax or REIT funds for various noteworthy projects and programs. And those are opportunity funds, about 1.5 million. And the other one is bicycle program, about 1.5 million. The other um, important um, projects are North Creek Trail, Emergency Repairs, Kenya Park Sub-Area, Transportation Demand Management, East Riverside Drive Trail, and lastly, increased REIT funding for North Creek Trail and 102nd Avenue Northeast Downtown Access. We also appropriated about 10 million of traffic impact fees for designated transportation projects. The large projects worth mentioning are 222nd Street Southeast widening, Bother Way Northeast improvements, 9th Avenue Southeast, and 35th Avenue Southeast. Appropriated American Rescue Plan funds about 2.5 million for comprehensive plan transportation element, Main and Festival Street, and the demo of various vacant park buildings and structures. We also increased awarded grant funds 
that were obtained for a project about $43 million, including the recently re awarded raise grant of $19 million. These grant funds will make it possible to complete a number of key projects that the city has been working on for the past seven years. Increased streets and sidewalks levy funding for overlay and sidewalk projects that are listed high on the overlay or sidewalk priority list, including additional levy funding for a sidewalk program, about $3 million. We've added two new sound transit funds for downtown sound, sound transit, yeah, access. <laughs> for um, a lot of projects, um, 104th Avenue Northeast and Bike Box. Included capital operating programs that are located in the back of the CFP document. These programs are ongoing capital improvement programs that unlike capital projects are recurring. Some are a series of smaller projects undertaken to achieve a specific purpose. Others are significant recurring capital planning efforts. The key programs are sidewalk, pavement preservation or overlay, bike, bridge, or even neighborhood traffic common. And the primary funding source is real estate excise tax. We re removed six projects that were completed prior to 2023-2029 CFP, including Bothell Crossroads and Horse Creek improvements. Updating and refining the CFP regularly is vital because as the projects progress, Financial and timing data becomes more um, more accurate and identifiable. This CFP contains 85 facility, park, transportation, and utility projects. It comprises of secured capital funding sources of 470. $79 million, $362 million is non-utility capital revenues, and $117 million is utility capital revenues. $92 million is unsecured, $15 million is parks, and $77 million is transportation. The couple of reasons for this are grant funding opportunities are not identified at this moment and or feasibility study or design work must occur before proceeding to right-of-way acquisition and construction to obtain a more accurate project scope. 51% or $240 million of $479 million is funded by non-city resources such as grants, sound transit, mitigation fees, um, developers' contribution, and non-city compensation. What this means is that for every dollar being spent on capital projects, only 49 cents um, is city money such as real estate excise tax, impact fees, and special levies. Since year 2006, previous CFPs doc have documented 32 to 42% funded by non-city resources and 58 to 68 funded by city. This 2023-2029 CFP is a success, which is made possible due to successful grant and other agency applications. The 
proposed the proposed four hundred and seventy nine million dollar CFP is a coordinated citywide effort that has a vast impact on the community and its livability. Here are donut charts which display the 2023 through 2029 summary allocation of estimated capital revenues on the left and project cost on the right. Unsecured is in the middle. Here you see two summary tables which display the allocation of estimated funding sources on the left and capital spending on the right. The CFP includes six non-utility debt services. We have lift and that was awarded to fund crossroads on construction in year 2007. Payments are funded by lift tax rebates, 50% also um, traffic impact fees. It matures in 2039. City hall lease payments are funded by 90% REIT and 10% general fund. It matures in 2039 with an option to refinance on or before December 2024. Public Works Trust Fund Loan was awarded to fund Crossroads construction in 2012. Payments are funded by traffic impact fees. It matures in 2031. 2013 bonds were issued to finance multiway boulevard construction and the um, acquisition of North Shore School District property. 50% payments are um, funded by 50% REIT and 50% traffic impact fees. Those bonds are mature in 2033. Public works, public safety capital funds, bonds one and two were issued to fund the fire station replacement project. Payments combined are funded by special levy and a portion of fire impact fees. The first bond matures in 2040 and the second bond materials in 2042. The CFP also includes three utility debt services. Utility revenue bond was issued to finance various large utility projects, including Hoist Creek in 2014. Payments are funded by sewer, storm, and water user fees. It matures in 2034. Public Works Trust Fund Loan was awarded to fund Horse Creek construction in 2013. Payments are funded by storm user fees and it matures in 2032. And lastly, Public Works Trust Fund Loan was awarded to fund Fala Hala utility construction this year. Payments are funded by <coughs> sewer, storm, and water user fees. It matures in 2042. So in addition to uh, local funds, such as REIT, transportation impact fees for, um, as, as an example, transportation projects, we do get a lot of external revenue sources. So one of the things I want to do is give you some context on grant funding the amounts we can get and kind of the complexity about going after these grants. I think most of you probably have heard this, so I'm going to probably drag you through it one more time. Um, so let's talk about grants. Um, I'm going to use transportation grants most for the descriptive purposes. I'm most familiar with those. So first, Bothell is pretty successful in getting outside funding, and that's a good thing because we really heavily rely on it. We can't do it alone just with our own local funds. We try to leverage as many many grant dollars per local dollar spent. 
so we can get the greatest bang for our buck, so to speak. On some projects, we may get up to eight out of $10 from external sources. Grants are competitive. Uh, they're not a sure thing. Typically, there are scoring criteria. There are many applicants and typically not enough dollars to go around. As an example, projects that serve, that score well, typically serve a regional growth center like Canyon Park, are multimodal, serve a lot of people, or unfortunately have a lot of accidents that have happened on the corridor. If the project does not score well, it may never qualify for grants, and those are the ones that we have to find ways locally to fund. Um, there are often specific types of projects that grants will fund. And grants are not necessarily available every year. Some are ye yearly, um, mainly the state grants. Some are um, every two years, like federal grants. And some are intermittent, such as when Congress approves a new program, such as the re recent bipartisan infrastructure law which is a five-year program, but we haven't seen one of those for quite a while. Sometimes we're applying for grant funds that will be available three years down the road as well. So we have to plan ahead in order to start a project. Most grants require local matching funds. Um, as an example, our bread and butter is a surface transportation program, STP, which is federal funds. Um, they match up to 16.5%. Um, however, in order to be competitive, some grants will give you more points if you provide more local match. Um, typically, as an example, on overlay projects, although we could get 86.5%, we typically wind up paying about 50% in order to score well and make sure we get the grant. There are typically limits uh, to the amount the grants will fund. Um, the surface transportation program, if it's a regional project um, like 522 or some of the trail systems like the Burke Gilman Trail and North Creek Trail can compete on a regional level, they could get as much as five and a half million dollars on a grant. Um, if not, it could be four million dollars or less. Non-motorized grants currently, like Safe Route to School and the PED bike grants, they typically max out at two million dollars per award. So the intent of this slide is to highlight a couple of things. It is somewhat busy. Um, first, there's a number of grants available. These are just the transportation grants. As I indicated earlier, if you look on the frequency cycle, not every one is every year, so you have to plan ahead a little bit. If you look at the next application year, a lot of these are in 2024, because this year was just one of the grant cycles. The next funding, sorry, the next funding year essentially is if you apply in 2024, some of these you will get money in 2027. So that's when you can start spending the money. And in certain cases, if the agency is prepared, we might be able to um, fund it earlier. In other words, we might take a debit and say we're going to pay for it now and get funded later. But that's a special request. So typically, like I said, for those federal grants, we're looking three years out beyond the application year just to start the project or get the first phase funded. Um, let's see. Note the maximum amount of grants, which I talks to, talked about. Each one has a little bit different swing to it. Um, some of them max out at $5 million. Non-motorized, unfortunately, currently maxes out at $2 million if it's not a regional project. Um, there are some federal programs like RAISE that the range is like five to $25 million. So you really have to plan ahead and make sure you um, put into the appropriate uh, type of grant. So this is the parks one, which I'm not an expert on. Um, but similarly, you can see the frequencies vary. You can see that the next application years are, some of them are coming up next year. Some have to wait two years from now. And these tend to be awarded a little bit more earlier. In other words, if you get the grant, you can start spending it next year. But you also see in the notes that there's a range of limits or minimums for grants so that you have to make sure you're in that range when you apply for projects as well. So another source of funding is uh, um, Washington legislator or congressional, the federal. So on the federal side, you can get allocations or earmarks, but they're also competitive kind of in a different sort of way. Typically, the senators or representatives will somehow prioritize the requests that they get since they're limited in amounts that they can ask for and the limited in amounts that can be awarded. 
Uh, they have, again, may have funding parameters ranging from maximum allocations for $2 million for some things. Larger project could be allocated anywhere from 5 to $20 million. Um, again, typically federal, this type of federal uh, funding maxes at 80%, so the city would have to find the other 20% somewhere. Uh, Washington legislator can provide appropriations. We've been pretty successful with this. Again, competitive. There's a lot of agencies looking for money for different things. Um, we were successful in getting money for North Creek Trail, uh, Section 4, and $7 million for the Both Away project. And then we do have other sources of funding, like um, Gretchen said. Um, typically, these are agencies we're partnering with, like Sound Transit. So we currently spent money to design and get right away for stage three on SR-522, but when the package ST3 was um, approved, we worked with them and said, hey, you guys should pay for construction because these are bat lanes and this is what you want to use. And so they paid 100% pretty much for the construction phase. So that also is ways that we can get external funding. So what I'd like to do is kind of quickly work you through a working example just to kind of give you an idea on some of these larger projects, um, what we go through to try to plan it and what, what we go through to try to get funding for it. Again, it's just a context to give you an idea of time and funding. Um, this project is an ideal project. It's, it's a multimodal project. It's connecting to a regional growth center in our downtown and a campus. It's installing bike lanes. It's installing pedestrian. When we do it, we're going to entice community transit to come down to its swift. So it kind of hits all those marks, and it's been scoring really well. The problem is the project is estimated about $63 million. Okay. So you remember when I told you the maximum grants in the STP world were about $5.5 million. So how do you fund a project when if you get $5.5 million, and let's say you get a state grant with a maximum of $5 million, you're still looking for another $50 million, which the city really doesn't have. So what we typically do is we break it into phases and segments. Um, you can fund the project if there's a functional phase. In this case, we broke it up linearly in three phases. Like we did the first phase in the south portion with an intersection, the second phase in the north por portion with a 240th Street intersection, and then the middle one as a separate section. And we also broke it up into design phases and right away and construction phases. So it's kind of broken up into nine little pieces, so to speak. So this is how it actually turned out. Way back in 2018, we were applied for our first grant for the entire design, which was about $5 million perhaps, and we got $3 million. But like I told you, we couldn't start spending it until three years later, 2021. So be before we even started design work, 2020, another round of grants came up two years later. So we applied for right away phase one and two in that one. And we got those as well. But again, we can't spend those until three years out from that time. In 2021, we were fortunate to apply for a Washington state legislative allocation, $7 million. We got that. That helps a lot. This year, we applied for three grants through the STP process, and we got all three. So phase one and two construction and phase three right away. Um, but again, we can't start spending that until 25, 26. And based on our project timeline, we're shooting for starting construction in 26. So at that point, you kind of stop and take a look at it. We have to pay about seven and a half million in transportation impact fees up to that time. That's what we thought we would provide. And about $300,000 from the water utility. So we still had a gap. Again, fortunately, this year we applied for a raise grant, which are far and few between, but we did get that. So to finish the entire thing, we still have a six to eight million dollar gap. But we do have some grant opportunities coming up. State TIB um, grant is one of them. And because this is not going to be built till 26, 20, 28 maybe, we have another round of federal that we might be able to go after. Okay. Now, oftentimes we have to tell these agencies that we can finish the project if they give us this money, like the raise grant, which we can, but the city really doesn't want to spend the six to eight million dollars of transportation impact fees plus the seven and a half million dollars all on this project. We'd rather spend it on other projects. 
So we guarantee that we can pay for this. That's the worst case. But in the best case, we're applying for other grants and replacing that local money with other grants. So at the end of the day, what's happening here is for projects $10 million or over, it takes multiple grant cycles for us to complete these projects. And unfortunately, sometimes for pedestrian or bike projects, the way the grants are set up, the awards are smaller. So even a smaller project, you may have to do in phases. But the city is pretty, pretty good at getting grants. We just have to be persistent. And one of the things that we try to do is provide seed money so that when there are grants available, we have that match that we can apply for. Back to you, Aaron. Oh, the other way. Let's try this. Like yes, thank you. Good evening, Council. Uh, so this is the last uh, part of our kind of general overarching conversation before we dig into the project. So I wanted to speak a little bit about uh, operations and maintenance, or maintenance and operating costs, M&O. Um, while the bulk of the funding described in the CFP is for the one-time capital costs, uh, staff also provides estimated ongoing costs associated with each project, and you'll find it at the bottom of each page. As project staff develop capital improvements, operations staff utilize the information about those improvements to determine the resource needs for the ongoing M&O. The ongoing M&O needs vary greatly depending on the project. So many utility projects, for example, replace older, often maintenance-intensive infrastructure. This allows staff to move resources to other infrastructure that needs attention. So you'll see a very low, if any, M&O impact on many of our utility projects. Other projects, for example, um, a splash park, uh, would require substantial additional resources to operate and maintain. So you would see not only M&O costs, but you would see projections for added staff needs associated with projects like that. Uh, as the city manager mentioned, just as the first two years of the CFP expenditures for projects are incorporated into the capital budget, departments incorporated the associated M&O resource needs into our operating budgets. So the one of the reasons that this is incorporated into the capital facilities plan is so that you as decision makers understand the ongoing life cycle needs uh, that come with these new projects. Because even though things are new and shiny, um, they require work from the get for the most part. So that's it for m and And I think now we're, we're on to our first uh, question slide. Do you have any um, questions before we um, start talking about exciting stuff, projects? Oh, thanks, Mayor. Thank you for the presentation. A lot of information, just like the packet. Um, I, first question is, as I always ask, you presented, the way you presented the information was awesome. Is it, can you send us your talking points? and these slides after this, if that's okay. Um, and the second question is, it seems like grants is uh, a high ROI activity. So I wonder, do we have dedicated grant writers in the city today? We don't actually have dedicated grant writers. Um, so in the transportation side, uh, the city engineer, deputy public works director, Eddie Lowe, basically kind of leads the charge. Uh, he and I and a couple others strategize on how we're gonna approach this year's cycle and next year's cycle, and we it's an ongoing thing. Um, the capital division engineers actually fill out the applications and they make the presentations themselves. So we have, that's a good thing. We have about you know eight to 11 engineers who have the ability to do that. And like this year, just transportation-wide, I think we submitted about 15 applications. And it takes a lot of work to fill out one, and then you have to go defend it. 
Um, and then if you get it, there's a lot of paperwork as well. So that's a good thing that we can spread it out that way. So that's why every year during budget cycle year in the spring when all the grants are due, you see a lot of tired engineers because in addition to the work they're doing, they're actually filling that out. I think on the stormwater utility side, that's uh, Boyd Benson's group, the utility manager. Um, I think he has a, a utility engineer that helps out with some of the utility, water and sewer type grants, public works trust fund loans, and then Janet takes a really good job on stormwater, going after stormwater grants. So you don't need any grant writers? Well, when it sounds we talked, like it's <laughs> yeah. So when we talked about the transportation supervisor, that intent of that was to spread the load a little bit further because it's not only grant writing, but it's that regional presence. It's that attending the meetings and advocating for the city, which takes a lot of time. And our city engineer and Aaron spend a lot of time doing that. Um, so what es essentially happens is when our priority becomes bringing in more money, the actual execution of spending the money and putting the projects together takes a hit. And sometimes our planning takes a hit too because um, planning is a big part of uh, transportation funding, so to yeah. speak. Uh, we're getting a lot of money now and those engineers really need to be used uh, to actually implement the money that we're getting. So we do need somebody to actually help us on that end. And that's why the transportation supervisor was brought forward to you folks. Okay. It's, um, I, I'm asking the question because it seems to me like there's a lot of opportunities. And this is not just in this year's. I mean, every year there's going to be conversation, or every two years, I guess, depending on the cy grant cycle. There's always work that we need to do because now we're planning seven years. In two years, we're going to plan the next seven years and so forth. So it's always... Yeah. We need, always need to plan ahead and yeah. look at things in the future. I think the next four years is critical because that's the life cycle of that BIL, the federal um, funding program. And that's a five-year window. And then who knows if there's going to be another one that follows that. So all the agencies right now are scrambling to try to figure out how to do that. Um, and that's one thing that we're doing too. There's certain... with. With grants, sometimes there comes ties and requirements, and so we have to balance that on whether the amount of money that we can get through those is worth it for the city with the restrictions and our obligations forevermore on that particular project. So all that takes time, and again, that's another reason why we're asking for that from the transportation side. Yeah, I, I mean, it seems like it's a greater just looking at uh, the packet and then from your just high-level presentation now, it seems like across multiple departments there's going to be a need for dedicated folks to help with the execution writing of the grants and then with uh, the subject matter experts being in the places they need to be to be able to defend or form their relationships or whatever you know so like breaking up of the roles and responsibilities and it sounds like that role of uh, somebody, one or more people writing grants is, doesn't exist today. Uh, like dedicated folks, not an engineer, like Mayor, folks on engineer and writing grants. Deputy Mayor, I think it's a, it, you know, it's a great question to be looking at, and I think that is one where, um, again, as we're going through the budget cycle, the our department directors are working with their teams to evaluate what are the resource needs and what's going to make us the most and, effective. So, I mean, I think what what Steve was able to describe is a reflection of kind of the current staffing strategy of how we take things on. I know that there's always questions about, do we want to do an alternative model? Um, I think Bothell's been fairly successful in, in how we're doing it. It doesn't mean that we wouldn't try something else. But um, right now, again, I think I, I would just tell you, in the <clears throat> budget proposal coming forward, we have not anticipated adding a grant writer position. But as Steve mentioned, we are looking for ways to increase the capacity of the team that's doing it. Um, to, to remain competitive. So there's there's a balance. There's different ways of, of doing it. I think it's a, it's a good question and a good challenge for us to continue to look and think, is there an alternative service model that would make us even more successful? I'm just thinking similar to how we hire the lobbyist. I mean, you hire somebody who's dedicated to help you do a task, and they're very successful at it. And it sounds like the hypothesis is, given how successful engineers who are already double booked doing the work if we get somebody dedicated then that's going to be a good time spent just my opinion i don't know if others agree or disagree or we can have a discussion later i just wanted to 
was an observation that I have and a question. That's it. Council Member Aldrichs. Thank you, Mayor, and uh, thank you, Deputy Mayor, because I, I have I do recall um, several conversations over the last several months about would this be an appropriate place for a grant, a grant um, manager or a grant writer to be in so that we could be more effective at, at bringing outside money in. Um, and so it's just, I guess, what to your point, uh, city manager, that we would want to each of the department heads to say, yes, this is, <laughs> I would like this in my department so that we could make uh, room for that in, in um, the budget. But um, I also just want to say that I was remiss earlier about a, a, a committee update. I attended the East Side Transportation Partnership and there was a lot of praise for Bothell getting uh, regional, state, and national funds for the Bothell Way Improvement Project. And um, Steve did a good job of, of reviewing where those funds came from, how they're being used, how we got them. Um, but we're looking really good in the region because of the work of those engineers and those grants that were applied for. Um, and so I just want to uh, shout that out and say that Bothell is getting some good press from uh, the work of staff. So thank you very much for that. I don't see any more questions. Now I hand the presentation over to um, Jeff Sperry to talk about facility projects. Good evening, Council. Uh, we have uh, two projects on the facilities capital projects. Uh, the first one is the 2018 Safe and Secure Bond, which is for the replacement of Fire Station 42 and Fire Station 45. Um, both have been in ongoing projects since 2019 uh, with design, demo construction, and interim, four interim and permanent stations. Uh, currently, Fire Station 45 uh, received some substantial completion earlier this month. Um, Fire Station 42 uh, is anticipated to have substantial completion March of 2023. Uh, for Shop 1, the second project um, as a replacement that it, as a part of the I-405 expansion project, Washington State Department of Transportation purchased a portion of the property that Shop 1 uh, is located at. The city received a market value offer from the Washington State Department of Transportation of around $800,000 and participated in negotiations that resulted in an agreement. Uh, to instead fund full fund functional replacement of the building in addition to the city receiving land acquisition value. Uh, the portion of the property that they purchased resulted in the demolition of the Shop 1 building that is used by Public Works Operations staff and Fleet and Facility staff. Um, the Capital Division currently has managed the old building demolition project uh, which was completed earlier in 2022 and are currently in design for the new building scheduled to be completed in 2023. Yep. So with that, uh, any questions? All right. Councilman Braldricks. Um, I have not been on council for very long, so I've never seen a map of where that building is, uh, the shop one building is located. Um, could you provide a little more description so that I can kind of orient myself to where that is? For shop one? Yeah. Yeah, so that's located up off of Brickyard um, on the side of the dome. The west side of uh, the... 405 interchange uh, to 522. So if you know where Chasse Lumber is, it's actually right behind that. So you go underneath 405 and it's that lumber facility that's right there. And then right above that is our shop one facility. Cool, thank you very much.
Good evening, Council. Uh, my name is Aaron Milner. I'm the Parks Operation Lead. Um, I'm here along to you to present to you uh, the parks element of the proposed capital facilities plan. So to get started here, I wanted to give you some understanding on how we approach this process. Um, our parks recreation open space plan adopted in 2020 is our guiding document. Um, and we prioritize projects based upon that plan, as well as a priority in maintaining and improving our existing park system, taking care of what we have. Um, and developing a plan that is realistic and achievable. And this fourth point up here, building a foundation for future CFPs and capital planning is one that we'll touch on a little bit later as we move through this brief presentation. <clears throat> so I do want to give you a kind of a really brief timeline of our relatively young uh, Parks and Recreation Department. We were established in 2015. Um, we had a couple actually pretty big wins as far as acquisitions in the North Creek Forest and the former Wayne Golf Course in 2020. Um, we developed our pr first uh, parks recreation open sp space plan in, in 2020 as well as a, as a new young department. And then uh, COVID happened and uh, we had some particularly important staff layoffs in our, in our division or department and budget uh, reductions as well. So this leads us to where we're at right now in 2022, um, kind of building or I guess picking up where we left off uh, prior to, to COVID times. <clears throat> so I want to present to you this evening, we have 10 projects in our capital facilities plan. Um, and I kind of broke them up into three different categories. Um, one's this kind of development phase uh, category. We have a pre-development or planning phase category, which we'll touch on, and then projects that fall more within this conceptual uh, phase uh, category. So this, this first category, the development phase project, these projects are the ones that are closest to shovel ready, I, I suppose you could say. And Madrazo Park, this P11, this first one on the list, is probably our, our project that's most closely ready for construction. Um, we've actually completed design uh, for phase one construction of this two acre park. It's located in the North Creek Business uh, Park on a two acre parcel of land owned by King County Wastewater Facility. And we have a surface water or a surface agreement with King County Wastewater to develop a park on top of that. Um, and some of the, the, the facilities and amenities that will be associated with this park are a basketball court, walking paths, a formal play field, parking lot, restroom, picnic shelter, veterans, and a veterans memorial. Um, staff is considering the option, uh, given the fact that we have development in uh, the old Seattle Times uh, parcels uh, with the Avalon development. We'll get substantial park impact fees that will go a long ways in helping us uh, see this park become a reality. Um, the second project here we have on the list is the Horse Creek Plaza, this is a half acre open space just south of Popkini Stadium. Um, this plaza will serve as an open space to be designed to provide a place to gather as well as provide a viewing point for daylight at Horse Creek. Um, a, a good majority of this project is funded by development dollars and we're pro approximately at 60% design on that. P30, the demolition of vacant buildings and structures. It involves the repair of a structural element of a, a bridge on the former Wayne Golf Course uh, front nine uh, west, or west side um, that was recently identified and in, in dire need of repair, as well as the demolition of roughly nine structures that we mostly have acquired through these uh, acquisitions of parkland, mostly at the former Wayne Golf Course. We have a couple of structures at North Creek Forest and then one structure at William Penn Park as well. Um, demoing these buildings will help us out as far as operations and maintenance goes. Um, we do respond to these as far for vandalism incidences as well as break-ins. So um, there will be a, a net decrease in, in no cost for that, those. Uh, the last one on the list, synthetic turf replacement at North Creek Fields. Um, some of you attended our uh, ribbon cutting ceremony last 
Thursday for fields two and four. Um, we, it's important to realize that these fields don't last forever. <laughs> Our field one was replaced in 2016 and it will be due for replacement again in 2027. So on to our planning and pre-development phase projects. Um, this first one on the list is a very exciting one for a lot of us. It um, involves uh, the uh, Park at Bothell Landing improvements and um, involves several of the um, uh, several of the development zones identified in the 2010 uh, Park at Bothell Landing Master Plan. Um, this project is really a key to the downtown revitalization and um, a key component of uh, the rerouting of State Route 522 as well. Um, and it involves several opportunities that could include public gathering space, inclusive playground, splash pad slash fountain, water access improvements, restrooms, and parking. Um, P31, the former Wayne Golf Course Master Plan and Designs for, mass, for Passive Use Areas will provide us direction for some of the development that will eventually occur in the Passive Use Areas of uh, Wayne Golf Course. This will provide us some planning and design and direction um, in those areas that do not include the active space on the west side and the Sammamish River uh, Wainita Creek Restoration Project that's currently in design right now on the east side. P35 is a former Wayne Golf Course Trail Connector. Um, we were granted $1.25 million, or we have $1.25 million in available funding right now through King County levy dollars. Um, that money is available to us until 2025 uh, to provide a connector trail through the east portion of the Wayne Golf Course and into Blythe Park. <clears throat> Moving along now to the, more of these conceptual development phase projects. Um, the North Bothell Park acquisition is a new one to our CFP. This was on a future projects needs list that we added to the CFP. Uh, we recognize that there is a need for more parklands in our Snohomish County portions of our city. Um, as of right now, there's we don't, don't have funding or location identified for this, but it is added to our CFP. Uh, the skate park and pump track and the dog park kind of fall in two very similar categories in that they're recognized needs for some time within our community and our park system. Um, both of them, we haven't been able to locate a real satisfactory location. Um, and our proposal as staff is to, uh, to, um, to conduct feasibility studies for each of those to try to find out a location and scope for each of those projects. So this is our list of our 10 projects here. Uh, those highlighted in gray are ones that um, those are ones that have are fully funded. I do want to point out, unfortunately, there is a, an error in this slide in that the Horse Creek Plaza does have a funding gap, um, which I'll, I'll address in this next slide. But I, it's important to kind of, uh, it's important to um, note that parks approach this a little bit differently than our utilities, transportation and facilities did in that this goes back to our slide where we're building for future capital facilities planning and needs and that we are a young department and some of our projects are at this conceptual stage where we do need to provide seed money and design and development to understand the scope and impacts that future development will have. So with those projects, these are the projects that have unsecured funding. Um, and if you go down the list there, you can look at like, for example, the park at Bothell landing improvements. This is a little this is a little, uh, there's a lot of numbers here to look at, but if you look at the Park of Bothell Land Use improvement, Improvements, you have in 2023, we have $250,000 set aside um, for uh, taking this project to some level of design where we can have a better idea of scope of the project and leverage our dollars uh, a little better down the road. Um, Horse Creek Plaza is another one. This has actually been more in the, in the public works 
uh, in public works court for some time. Um, there is some um, there's some consideration on how uh, that project has gone fully developed as far as design goes and what that may look like in the end. North Buffalo acquisition, as I mentioned before, we don't have a clear sense on where, when, and how that property is going to be purchased. So that one is classified as unfunded at this point. Synthetic turf replacement, North Creek sports fields. This is a really a, a, a facility and an asset that is in need of replacement. We, we, we addressed our last uh, field replacements within the capital facilities program. Um, and we're at, at this point are proposing to do the same, but do not have funding secured to it. And as I mentioned, the skate park, pump track, and dog, dog park are all projects that are kind of at this point still up in the air, although we have some idea on how we want to go about tackling some of those issues, um, whether that's especially through like a feasibility study. So with that said, um, we do have this funding gap, as you can see in your in your in the bottom right hand corner of that spreadsheet there of 14.7 million. Um, but we do have an estimated available park impact fee end balance in 2029 of 11 million dollars. So we do have some available funding and projected funding to be able to use and leverage depending on how these projects develop and the scope develops for these projects after um, our initial design and feasibility efforts. So I do imagine that our 2025 CFP process will look considerably different than what we are proposing to you this evening. This slide is really just more of an informational slide, gives you an idea of potential future projects within Parks and Recreation. Um, that column to the left there are projects that are new to this CFP or newly identified needs. And so with all this, I, I mentioned earlier, we are a relatively lean department. Um, we do have some needs and resources um, to be able to pull off uh, the capital facilities plan as it's proposed to you this evening. Um, probably first and foremost, we do need somebody to carry out these uh, projects. Um, so the need for the parks capital project manager is one, one thing that would be necessary to be able to uh, fulfill the, the capital facilities plan. Um, one other consideration, um, is to hire a parks planner that may not may or may not be in the cards right now, but that is something that would be useful. Um, and then also we need to explore alternative funding processes of, as we work our way through the capital facilities plan, and hire consultants to assist us with these processes and the plan design and build of these projects. So with that, I'll open it up to any questions or comments for myself or Director Stroop? All right. Councilmember Zorns? I just want to make a couple of quick comments. <clears throat> um, one is uh, you have remi you reminded me that Council needs to place a priority on asset replacements. And um, your department's not the only department that needs us to make that a priority. And we desperately, as a council, need to start figuring out how we prioritize asset replacements from um, vehicles that need to be replaced to turfs that need to be replaced. So um, I'm just asking that of council. Um, and then the other thing is, um, just uh, echoing what I'm sure all of council would be um, also saying that we need to do is that if we can bring in some partners that want to have a park named after them or a playground named after them and they're willing to pay for it, um, let's 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 go go for that golden ring. So um, anything that you can you know any help that you want from council on doing that, give us a shout because I'm sure we're all we're all on that same page. Thank you. This is uh, parks is um, something that uh, 
for some reason, everybody recognizes the need when it's not there, just like, you know, plumbing, you know, it's like, if it doesn't work, then, oh my God, where's, you know, um, um, I, I th the question I had was the difference between, in your previous slide, the difference between, uh, I understand the project manager, I don't understand what a parks planner means in this context, like, what what is it, I understand transportation planner, because maybe because Steve has been with us a lot, lot more than you, but what does a park planner do? Well, the, oh, well go ahead. Okay. So uh, they, they work together. So when you think of in terms of, you know, building a project, taking it through design, taking it through construction up to ribbon cutting, that's more of a capital facilities plan, you know, manager type position. A planner is that person who's sort of behind the scenes, strategically looking you know, for the next seven to 10 year horizon, what are the, the, the grant opportunities? They, they start to develop those, they start to write those grants, and then they work together to bring those projects forward. So a, a, a parks planner is a very common position that you find in most park departments. Uh, again, we're, we're really young, so, and we recognize that this may not be the time for that position. However, it is something that we believe somewhere down the road and somewhere soon we should probably be talking about. I mean, sounds like something that looks like will help in council member Zorn's suggestion of going, because you mentioned alternative funding sources helping with that. I mean, I feel like that's something, that's like I asked about grant writers earlier. It sounds like this, this could be a, a combo role that way. Yeah, and I think Deputy Mayor, the, what, uh, as we're having these conversations internally and thinking about <clears throat> what are the investments to make, to continue to help Bapa move forward, I think you're right on the right track, is that, um, as, as Nick said, part of this is is the, the capital projects manager figuring out the how, and I think the parks planner position, I've seen that be in a really effective way, too, of not only helping us actually execute on, on projects, but there's also the importance of getting vision um, and being able to communicate out to the community about what what is the goal and what are we looking for. So it's one thing to say, you know, it, it, we see in our community survey, people are going to tell us they want more parks, they want more recreation. Being able to have the vision of what does that actually look like and what are the possibilities is an important investment. And so the, the question that we're really going to be wrestling with together in the fall is, is, are we at the point to do that now? Is it coming soon? Like, what's the what's the iteration? But I do think, as, as Nick said, I think it's a... Um, a very complimentary position to really help us move forward and continue to develop our, our parks um, system within this community. I mean, it sounds like from the list, so many, so many things that need to happen in the next few years, and I feel like the longer we wait to hire somebody critical to help us think through those issues, the longer it'll take to implement some of those things uh, in the future. But uh, thank you, I appreciate it. Councilmember Alderks. Thank you, Mayor. Um, thanks for this presentation. I just want to let you know that council really values parks. We really, really do. Um, and we, we've seen the struggles that the department has gone through, especially through the pandemic. Um, and so I just want to shout out to the 14 roles that were lost in the pandemic. And, and while that might not be part of capital planning, that, is, that should be part of budgeting, um, recognizing that there is, there's a, um, a lot that we need to do as a community to show that we do value the Parks Department as much as we spoke about in our council retreat. Um, and so I really do appreciate you bringing um, the, this presentation to us, showing us that like we actually have some things that are already funded. We we are going to be doing things for parks in the coming in the next couple of years. Um, I'm looking forward to the the North Creek locate. Um, I drove by, and so I know exactly where you're talking about. Um, I was excited to see that there was a a proposed land action happening there. Good to see it brought up here and that knowing that it is funded. Uh, next up, I guess, is I'd really love to understand more about where the siting for a North Bothell Park would be. My understanding is that it's going to be in Snohomish County. Um, we recognize that Snohomish County has not gotten the love that they deserve when it comes to parks, and this is one step towards that. 
Um, so I'd really love to hear a little more about some of the locations that are being considered if you've even gotten that far in the process. So at this point, we really haven't gotten that far in the process. I mean, land is hard to come by. And what we're hearing from a lot of our residents is they'd like to find, you know, places that are active space, active use, uh, meaning that they don't have the restrictions on them. You can put playgrounds, you can put other things. And there is a, you know, I, I, I do understand the, you know, the, the thought that, that Snohomish County parks have not, you know, received equal treatment. But I think it's also important to kind of talk about, you know, the city, we, we incorporated in 1909 and um, there was about 80 years there before we took over the, the portion of Snohomish County. But since 1999, we actually have developed four parks. Uh, we developed Stipec Park first in 1999. Uh, we developed Cedar Grove Park in 2005. We developed uh, the North Creek Forest, or 30 acres of that. We acquired that in 2011. It was the old Boy Scout property. And um, I think I'm missing one other in there. Trails. Centennial Park, a big park, 54 acre park. Uh, we did that in 2008. And then we've done a number of trail improvements that Steve mentioned with the North Creek Trail uh, improvements. So if you really look at it from an acreage standpoint, since 1999, we've added 102 acres of parklands in Snohomish County uh, compared to King County where we've added 127. So it is actually a little bit closer than, than people might think, um, you know, over the last 20 years or so. That, that's really valuable information, and I think it's good for the public to hear that. Um, that, you know, there's a difference between something, you know, an, an area that's been part of our city for only 20, 30 years, as opposed to the rest of the city. So um, that's really good perspective and good history, and I'm really glad you shared it. Thank you. Councilmember Mankey. Thank you, and thank you for the presentation. Uh, I don't really have any questions, but I do have a couple comments. Uh, I think like everyone up here, I probably have my fair share of favorite uh, projects on this list, being a North Bothell resident, seeing that uh, park acquisition, and knowing the parks director has fielded a number of questions from me about potential locations. Um, <laughs> I love seeing it on there. Uh, being a, a classmate of Lieutenant Madrazo, that one's great as well, and then being a parent, um, seeing the downtown park completed and a potential splash pad, which has, I know, many M and O, um, a large M and O element to that. So that's going to be something fun to talk about someday. But just wanted to say, the city values parks. The residents value the parks. I know, unfortunately, during the pandemic, the parks department got hit the hardest uh, with staff cuts. But I think we have a great, great list of projects here. I think it sells itself in terms of if people knew what these projects were and um, what our intent is with this with this plan over the next seven years, um, I think there'd be a lot of interest in that, which is a good thing. I guess the down the downside is there's a $15 million gap, uh, which is not impossible, but um, is difficult. So thanks for putting this together. Uh, again, a lot of great projects in here, and I think the council is very supportive of seeing our parks um, expand, upgraded, and nothing kind of showed us what parks are worth like the pandemic did. I, I'm pretty sure I visited parks about 10 times more than I had prior. So and I've seen many residents out at the parks as well. Oftentimes um, playground equipment became, uh, I wouldn't say overused, but it was very crowded, which is good to see people outside enjoying and getting recreation. So thank you so much. I don't have any questions that weren't answered the questions of my colleagues, I just want to echo, I guess I'll repeat all on one thing, just my appreciation for everybody in parks for having to pick up the slack um, for the last couple of years because you guys lost people and everybody used parks more. And I'm sure you will happily remind us of all of these things that we've said next month um, when we start uh, budget discussions in, um, in earnest. Um, and that'll be okay. So thank you.
Good evening, Mayor and City Council. Boyd Benson, Public Works, along with Janet Gear mm -hmm. from Public Works. Tonight we'll provide a brief summary of uh, water, sewer, and storm and surface water projects within the proposed capital facilities plan. Uh, first, we'd like to provide you just a, a brief overview of the utilities before we get into specific projects. The goal of these utilities is to provide safe and reliable service in accordance with local, state, and federal standards. Um, at level at, 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 at level of services that satisfy both the regulations and customer expectations. I'd like to remind council that these are enterprise funds. These are sole distinct funds that are separate from the general fund and they neither subsidize or take funds from other funds. Uh, the goal is to provide revenue and expense that's balanced over the long term. Uh, the city of Bothell is considered a full service city. That means we have sewer water and stormwater utilities. Uh, sewer and water within the King County portion and uh, stormwater within both Snow and King County. Uh, that provides opportunities and efficiencies uh, with respect to staffing. We have uh, a depth of staff that can complete day-to-day -day activities, but also respond to larger projects and emergencies, snow plowing and the rest, but also opportunities with respect to projects. Um, I'll take the uh, 185th quarter project we'll be talking about in a few minutes, and, and that's a project where we can combine sewer water, stormwater utility improvements along with roadway improvements to provide efficiencies, reduce uh, disruption to services and, and transportation and, and save cost. Um, the utilities in 2021 had a combined revenue of about $23 million. So it's, it's a substantial, uh, there are substantial funds. About $2.4 million of those were to pay common city uh, services such as finance or HR or legal. Um, $1.2 million in utility tax. So uh, although the utilities don't, can't support the general fund, there are funds coming from the utilities to help support services. Uh, the utilities are primarily fun funded by uh, utility user rates. Uh, development and redevelopment pays their fair share. As they come in, they, uh, they, they buy into the system basically and help, help support future growth projects by paying capital facility charges. They also are required to improve existing utilities and roadways along the frontage. Um, and of course, staff are always looking for opportunities for grants and loans. Uh, grants because uh, they're, they help quite a bit, and then loans because they help spread the cost of projects over time. Uh, the city utilities are, are seen more of as cash-based utilities where we save up money and do projects. Uh, the loans help spread that out over time so we can we get more work done without increases in rates. And finally, with respect to finances, uh, the, the financial health of the utilities are looked at multiple times a year. Uh, we see milestones such as the annual uh, utility rate updates um, and the financial work done for both the two-year budget and the seven-year capital facilities plan. So we're looking at the long-term financial success of these facilities. So just a, a general overview of the projects within the capital facilities plan with respect to utilities. Uh, the 2021-2027 capital facilities plan was developed during pretty much the peak of the COVID epidemic. And what you saw at that time, because of uncertainty about revenue and, and what was going to happen, that quite a few projects were deferred. Um, the current CFP has the full slate of projects that um, based on planning documents and, and recommendations are required to keep our utilities in safe, safe condition and operating in the future. So you'll see that there are, are more projects um, than the previous CFP. Um, once again, we're completed the projects to improve the existing system and to accommodate growth, meet federal uh, requirements. We'll talk about some of those during the, the rest of the uh, presentation. Um, the projects are identified from existing planning documents and also from known uh, issues and, and, uh, and items identified by our operations folks in the meantime. Uh, once again, we try to bundle projects as possible provide efficiencies. You'll see that some of the annual um, programs are, are really focused. If we, uh, if we repave a road, we might want to take care of that old water main first so we can get it done and not have to rip up new pavement in the future. Um, and we already kind of talked about uh, accommodating growth. And once again, the, uh, the goal of this is to make sure that development and redevelopment pays their fair share. So we'll go through each of the utilities. You'll see kind of a general overview summary slide. Um, we'll go through uh, projects 
and then a, a slide that kind of summarizes uh, grants and, and other opportunities. So for the water utility, uh, the projects selected from are selected from the draft 2022 water system plan, which council had observed earlier in the year. It'll come back for final approval uh, upon completion of some revisions with the Department of Health. Uh, you can see we circled the retail service area in general, which is the south half of the city. Uh, the majority of the north half of the city is served by Alderwood Wastewater and Water District. Uh, you can see some uh, kind of details showing where these projects are. So that the total estimate for projects within the planning horizon is significant. It's $24 million. And you'll see um, there's a range. You don't have the same range for either sewer or storm, but there's a range of both uh, revenue from rates and projected revenue from grants. That's because we're trying to prioritize uh, design and permitting of some of these projects so we're eligible for grants in the future. So you'll see some rather large reservoir projects where we may not, we're planning to secure grants, um, but we'll be doing the design and permitting in the next two years with let's look for grants over the next years till 2028-2029. So just a brief list of projects and type of projects. You'll see annual projects. The W1 projects have been updated to reflect our understanding of transportation projects and, and those opportunities that we discussed. Um, W2 is for facility improvements that aren't associated with water main. So that, that is almost a set aside fund. If we have a pump go down at a pump station, uh, we can't predict when that happens, so we set aside funding so it's there if needed. Um, for the water main projects, uh, a few of these were within the existing CFP, and they've been separated out as distinct projects. One, it, it helps us with grants, and two, it just helps with financing and accounting. So you'll see the Valhalla Neighborhood Project and the 185th Project were in previous CFPs, but um, they're now separated out. Uh, a couple of ones to highlight here would be the Woodcrest Utility Improvement Project. Uh, this is for, uh, uh, it's actually right near Shop 1, so in the southeast corner of the city where it's, it's considered more of an affordable housing area, um, but the utilities are not in the best shape. So we're trying to get that design done early so we can look for, for grants. Uh, reservoirs and inner ties. Um, the uh, Morningside water system improvement is a good one to look at. Uh, this is to serve the northeast section of our service area where we have relatively low pressure and flow just because it's up on a hill. So we've had this in the past, but we've revised this to look at opportunities, not just improving a booster station, but to secure an inner tie with Alderwood water and wastewater uh, districts so we can actually serve and wheel water through there to, to serve this area. So we're working, staff's working on that. Uh, the Bloomberg, not the Blomberg, Reservoir Repair Replacement. That was uh, in the previous CFP, and we'll correct that spelling. Um, but that initially started as a recoding project, but as we looked at that project as part of the 2022 water system plan uh, and reviewing the reservoir itself, there are some welds uh, and seams that have to be addressed. So we have put repair, uh, but once we uh, go through pre-design and evaluation, if it looks like the repair is close to the tank, cost, it will be consideration of replacement. And then Maywood Hills Reservoir Replacement, which is kind of in the middle central uh, north section of our retail service area, that's an area with, with very low water pressure, and it's, it's a function of the height of the reservoir and also some um, extra need for improved water quality. It's, it's, the quality is good. There is a chlorine booster station at that location, but we're looking at that as a replacement. And once again, these are the two reservoir projects are, are more long-term projects where we do the design and permitting early and, and position ourselves for grants. So in, oops, in summary for water capital improvements for the 2023-2024 biennium, uh, some of the big uh, kind of uh, budgeting considerations are the public works trust fund for uh, public works trust fund loan for Valhalla, which we're very Thankful to have, so that's up there. That's the uh, the share of the water utility of the four point six million dollars, um, and we're as I said, we're looking for future grants for Woodcrest and Maywood Bloomberg Reservoirs. So I'm going to switch on to sewer, and then hopefully take questions at the end after Janet goes through storm. So for the sewer capital projects, these are primarily from the 2018 sewer comprehensive plan. So it's a few years back, and that's been uh, supplemented by 
known operation needs and, and uh, opportunities since that time. So you'll see a few of the projects um, in, the, in the image to the left. Our retail service areas, once again, the, uh, the majority of the south half of the city within King County. Um, total project cost of a little over $12 million, uh, revenue from rates 9.6, and projected grants and loans for these projects are about 2.9. It's a much shorter list. Uh, we've had the uh, annual sewer main replacement project list has been updated, like once again, to look for opportunities with other projects, transportation and the rest. Uh, this annual sewer main extension program is a program that council um, allowed to be added in the previous CFP. This is very exciting for us. This is to extend sewer main to developed areas that are currently on septic. It helps with quite a few things. It helps with the, the owners when their septic drain fields fail, helps with environmental issues and the rest. Um, that's on there. We haven't actually been had the staff time to actually address that, but we're looking at addressing that more aggressively. And S3 is a new uh, program that's being proposed as part of this CFP. And this, once again, is very exciting to staff. Um, we're looking at an annual sewer main cure in place pipe program. And what this is, is instead of conventional excavation and replacement of pipe, which may cost anywhere from 200 to $600 a linear foot and causes disruption to pavement and the rest. You can actually use cure in place pipe where you, it's basically a, a resin coated material that you can draw through the pipe, expand in the pipe, and cure with UV light and without digging up the ground and going from maintenance hole to maintenance hole. Um, and that may be in the order of $50 to $100 a linear foot. So it's, it's a great savings. It, it, it basically prolongs the life of the pipe significantly. It's not new pipe, but it's, it prolongs the life. And uh, staff are looking at both standalone contracts for that, but an opportunity with Alderwood Wastewater um, and Water District where they have a consortium of six to seven, eight uh, other jurisdictions where they, they pool things together and they all go out for a common bid on these. So you'll be seeing um, recommended ILA language within the next few months to say, hey, we'd like to be part of this group so we can get some really good uh, costs on this cure in place pipe. And then for the sewer main projects themselves, the lift station one uh, bypass, this is associated with Valhalla and the Valhalla, once again, those been separated out. Those are in design and design right now with permitting soon with that public works trust fund loan with construction in 2023. Uh, 185th, we've discussed before, we separated it out, out and you'll see Woodcrest again. So that's what we have for sewer. And now we're on to Janet Gear. Oh, sorry. Um, a couple opportunities with respect to funding. Um, the 815 is the portion that's been identified from the Public Works Trust Fund loan for Valhalla. And once again, we're actively looking and designing the Woodcrest project for, um, for, for future grants. Uh, the images, I should have mentioned what these images are before. We must have been water. But uh, the one on the left, lower left, is lift station four, which was on the previous CFP, which is completed and working great. And the image on the right is just, this is what a new sewer pipe looks like. And it's a, it's a nice looking picture. So on to stormwater with Janet. Come on. Uh-oh. Okay, so um, as Boyd had mentioned previously, um, with stormwater, we get a little bit more inputs for how the projects are added to the list. Um, we address flooding issues, um, repair or replacement of an aging infrastructure. We also add flow control and water quality. So when we find existing systems that are either underperforming or they could provide a better water quality benefit, we do have a, a funding source to uh, um, provide retrofits to existing. And then um, we look at projects to improve stream health conditions. Um, these are identified through our comprehensive plan. Um, also staff for flooding issues or inspections. A lot of times with inspections we'll find those deficiencies. Um, these also come a lot from uh, residents, from customer action requests if you know they help us to uh, identify those, some of those issues that um, then get added to the list. And with partner agencies, um, either requests or opportunities again to, to work together. Um, they're prioritized based on uh, impact and significance. So people, property, environment, 
um, how many people is it impacting um, opportunities. Sometimes other projects are in the area, like Boyd had mentioned, or that we've got grant funding available that provides a good opportunity to move it up the list. Um, also liability and risk. Sometimes um, you know, our job is to protect our rate payers and our tax payers and, and manage those potential threats, and so um, those uh, liabilities might um, increase them up the, the priority list. And then mitigation. So a lot of our projects, if, especially if they have grant funding, um, there are uh, permit requirements, there's monitoring, maintenance, uh, mitigation, and uh, we make sure that they stay on the capital facilities plan until that's complete to make sure that there's adequate funding to uh, um, fulfill our obligations. Um, so why are they so important? Uh, as I think a few of you have mentioned too, um, you know, you don't really pay attention to your utilities unless they're not working, right? And so we're doing our job when you don't think about the stormwater, um, uh, and so that's kind of our major goal. Um, we uh, understand how important it is to in invest in that infrastructure and maintain it because it's far more expensive to replace it than it is if we were maintaining and, and keeping up with that over time. And then that preventative care also allows us for the planning to budget property properly and uh, minimize emergency responses. Emergency responses are really expensive and oftentimes they're not as effective and efficient as if we'd planned for it in advance. Um, and then just as Boyd had, Boyd had mentioned, um, how do we innovate? We try to make sure we always know what the right hand and the left hand are doing. Um, we've done a really good job over the last um, CFP and even better this time um, with understanding where transportation is going to be or utilities, um, talking to parks and, and you know making sure that we're coordinating our efforts as much as, as much as possible to reduce costs and then you know design strategies together. Um, so uh, this one's a much more comprehensive look and we just keep improving on that each time. So talking about um, storm projects, there's 14 total storm projects on our list. Um, and because of uh, COVID, so many were delayed. So there are seven on the list right now that are currently underway. A lot of those are in the design phase um, when we're moving several of those uh, quickly to construction. Um, and uh, I don't want to go through the whole exhaustive list, but as Boyd had mentioned, SW1 is to um, provide funding for um, things that come up kind of like, you know, with a transportation project, they find catch basins or pipes that we didn't anticipate needed to be repaired, replaced. We've got that budget for them. SW2 is that retrofit of existing systems I mentioned. And right now we're actively looking at a list of um, our ponds. Um, a lot of times that provides more, uh, less expensive, but great opportunities to make sure that those are functioning well and serving, especially in our neighborhood communities. And so we're focus focusing on those right now for our retrofitting dollars. Um, SW3 is that new one for slip lining cure in place. Um, I can say that our past CFP had one on the list that's uh, such a great candidate. We're going to save several million dollars by being able to use cure in place pipe instead of having to rip up the roads and um, cause all kinds of uh, issues for some uh, um, CMP pipe that has got, looks like Swiss cheese, so we just need to get it fixed. Um, and then, as Boyd mentioned, that 27, 28, and 29, um, we used to lump all these projects under SW1, but at one point we looked at it and we had eight different projects for storm that were just under SW1. And um, one, the budget has increased. So many things have gone up in cost, and so those projects that were only a couple hundred thousand now, you know, for storm can be a couple million, and so they really need to be separated out so you can really see what that budget is, how it's being um, addressed, and um, that we're um, appropriately um, paying for those um, with grant dollars as, as we can. Um, and then wanted to make sure that I mentioned the um, uh, restoration and fish passage. Um, so a lot of the times when we find a flooding issue, it's associated with um, a stream that can um, provide multi-benefit projects um, that also raises us up on the grant list. And so if it's fixing a flooding issue, but it also has a fish passage barrier or you know just a way that we can improve habitat, um, that provides us the opportunity to seek grant funding from multiple sources for the same project. And so they're really just feel good projects that help you know address a, a concern and, and improve um, existing conditions in the community. And so with the next slide, I just wanted to mention, so for securing grant funding just for 2023, we try as hard as we can to offset the burden to the ratepayers by obtaining federal, state, and local grants and loans, as Boyd mentioned, whenever possible. So we've secured 843,000 so far for 2023. Um, we have applied for another 2.4 million, um, and so we're hoping to hear good things from those um, very soon. And uh, we're also um, currently seeking another two to five million, um, depending again on those um, uh, timing and a lot of uh, 
of the projects. Like, for example, the um, Wainita um, Sammamish River restoration, we need to get that preliminary design done so that we can go for that next round of funding. So um, as they had mentioned, we're always in the planning process and understanding what we need in order to move to the next stage of grant funding for those efforts. Um, and then, as I mentioned before, a lot of these are multi-benefit, so they're really great candidates, and we end up scoring pretty well um, for projects that, um, you know, they they cover stormwater, but they also cover salmon habitat or salmon recovery and then water quality um, funding. And so with that, I will leave it open to any questions you may have for the utilities. Deputy Mayor. Thank you, uh, Mayor. Uh, you know, believe it or not, the, it's fascinating to see a clean sewer pipe for me. So it's like, it's really cool. So uh, I actually, you know, in seriousness, I like the, the materials technology to extend the life of pipes. I think that is really cool. Um, I guess a question that came up to me, I know you mentioned you respond to emerge. Uh, where there are floods or where people tell you where there are issues, are there, is there technology that you can use to not wait till a flood actually occurs, but you can preempt some of those maintenance um, projects? So um, is, there's a couple different ways we do that. We look at the um, water levels. Uh, they've got active gauges out there, and so our operations crews and um, our staff are constantly looking at those. Um, the other thing we do is look at regional, um, like CFS models. For example, North Creek, when I started here during a major event, would be about 900 CFS, and now I've seen it well over 1,200. Um, so we're constantly anticipating what those changes over time and what that's going to mean to our existing infrastructure. Um, the other thing I would think I would mention is um, we're also talking with staff that are out in the field um, because they anticipate and they see things that are going to come down, um, you know, over time. And so we're trying to anticip anticipate those as much as we can. Um, I can't think of anything else necessarily. I, I think the only thing to add to that, which I was complete, is 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 part of how we identify new projects. We mentioned that operations bring those to our attention. So all these issues are are mapped and identified, mm -hmm. and they're brought to the forefront. So we see these things and then we evaluate whether we should be addressing them or not. So it's, it's, it's kind of a really nice feedback loop. It's not just all models and plans. It's, it's, it's real time mm -hmm. response. And as we see changes uh, in storm duration or intensity, we might see more of those. We might see different issues. And so it's, it's, it's a really good way of looking at things. Okay, sounds good, thank you. Tell you what, hit this when you want to talk because I can't tell who's just looking at me and who wants to talk. Councilmember Mankey. <laughs> Thank you, Mayor. Um, Boyd, I was wondering if you could just talk for a moment about the importance of inner ties. I think the Capital Facilities Plan Committee really learned a lot about that. And for those that weren't involved in this process, this section actually had a lot of attention and people were really excited about this topic um, because it is very fascinating. So I was hoping you could just touch on the importance of inner ties in terms of having backup water sources and potential future, um, future effects on rates if we were to move to a different source of, of water and, and what that could mean for the, the residents. For sure, thanks for that. And I'm really trying to tone things down. I, I think this is very exciting. As you said, when the plumbing doesn't work or the parks aren't there, it's a big deal and you said the same. So thanks for bringing that question up. So when you look at our service area map, we're surrounded by other providers. Uh, we, we get our water from Seattle Public Utilities and that's the, the toll, which goes right through the park and other rest. And we have, we have connections to that and that's where we get our primary facilities. If the toll goes down, where do we get our water? We have a standby in our reservoirs um, that's mandated. Um, but we also have inner ties with adjacent purveyors. So um, we have inner tie with Alderwood, and it happens to be over kind of more in the northwest section of retail service area. We have an inner tie with, with North Shore and, and uh, kind of the southeast. Um, what's exciting about looking at those and opportunities is I mentioned that W6, W10 up there in that northeast corner. We don't have the capability of serving that zone from Bothell without 24-7 pumping from a reservoir. So if something happens and that pump station goes down, those folks in that pressure zone will be, will be out of water for a while. And it also has an impact to fire, fire flow and a fire response. When there's a, if there's a fire up there, um, 
it, it, it impacts how much flow we can get to the pumper trucks and the rest. So this is exciting stuff to look at. And we strategically look at where could we intertie. One, where does it make sense? Two, will the adjacent district be amenable to that? Three, will city council be amenable to that? And then how do we, how do we go? So that W6, W10, the reason we find this so exciting is right now we're proposing that to provide fire flow to that pressure zone. Um, should it be needed so we can draw on when needed and if Alderwood and Everett and PUD and council think that's a good idea and we we go forward we'll be successful the other option is when we do that Bloomberg reservoir which is in the, the W6 W10 we're taking that reservoir and that booster station down so how do we serve those homes and so the next step of that is well can we pull water from Alderwood for that and then the final is is are there opportunities to continue serving you know high pressure and flow to that that area and it's it's not to save money or this or that it's to provide good service so when we look at enterprise that's what we're looking at so it's it's a really good question and and that's kind of some of that long-term strategizing that we're looking as with respect to the cfp does that answer your question it does yes thank you and i just want to say one quick thing about stormwater too um our stormwater facilities here are fantastic i think if you go around the country and you see rain or snow melt it's not the quality and level that we have here i rarely see roads flooded here and if it if it's flooded it's usually because something like park creek which wasn't kept up by the private property owner and had to be uh, maintained properly and then all of a sudden the flooding seemed to to go away um, and um, likewise the creek over 228 palm creek um, i usually see that flooding only when there's severe rain or um, some other kind of event that would cause, you know, overflow, but it, it's also few and far between. So I think our city has done a really good job over time of building those facilities out. And um, we are lucky, I, th I believe, to have what we have. So thank you. Councilmember Zorns. Just a small comment <clears throat> on my field trip today down at the Issaquah fa sa uh, Salmon Hatchery uh, there was an Issaquah stormwater guy there and was talking about how Issaquah is focusing in on controlling pollution and water quality in stormwater. And my ears perked up and just had a brief conversation with him and talked about, I always get this, national pollution elimination and discharge NPDES, is that, did I get it? Yes. <laughs> um, I think that they, my impression is that they are a uh, growing, innovative, um, coming up with ways that we can actually affect quality of stormwater that's going in clean and cool into our waterways. And so I don't know if our city, uh, the current council will ever have a, you know, in our window have a chance to be proactive, but I think there are big things coming down in the pipeline, <laughs> pun intended, that that um, are waiting for stormwater, and I'm really excited to see what's, what's in the future for stormwater. It, I would say there's a lot coming, <laughs> um, and then 2024 with our next permit, um, they're really focused on nutrients and chemical inputs, and so you're going to see a lot more treatment that's uh, that's coming our way, both with design manual for uh, um, new and redevelopment, and then a requirement to maintain um, and improve existing. So there's a lot there's a lot that's going to gonna happen with existing as well. And if I can just add to that. Um, Issaquah may be good, but I think City of Bothell may be better. So I like I just, that. I just want you to understand the Stormwater Group is is seen by other oh, no. I, I converse with them as as a leader uh, okay. in stormwater, and then just with respect to the design manual, that um, I just putting a plug in for develop and redevelopment. Some folks think that's bad for stormwater, but the current stormwater regulations are extremely strict. So when you have a 20-year-old development with a little tiny pond or a vault, uh, if that redevelops, they're looking to match the discharge from that site to a fully forested condition. So they're looking at prehistoric conditions, basically, before development. And that's, that's really exciting. So when you see these projects come in, there's a lot of stormwater infrastructure that's, that's put in very carefully for both flow control 
So it acts more like a natural forest or keeps the water on site and keeps the water clean. And with the upcoming regulations changes uh, with respect to water quality, we'll see that, that continue to improve stormwater quality well, within the well, city. I would expect nothing less than you, you guys staying right on top of that. And I really appreciate you. And I'm, I'm sitting on the edge of my seat seeing what's next. So thank you. I'll jump in and just say uh, thank you for the presentation and for for making just the the copious amounts of water that go through our area um, interesting. How you keep us safe um, from from flooding. Um, just uh, soon after I joined council, our um, our newly retired former uh, interim community development director uh, Jeff. <laughs> that was a very long title. Um, <laughs> Uh, Jeff Smith uh, took took me and the deputy mayor out on a tour of Bothell, and 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 he went through um, in surprising detail some of the water woes that various neighborhoods experience, and um, and you all are the people who are you know making sure that that homes are staying dry, and that people are staying safe. And so thank you very much. Um, it's good to see that you do not have the problem that the parks department has. Most of these projects are fully funded. That's a relief, um, and yeah. So just thank you for for your continued good work in this area, and for your passion for this area of of study and, and work. Thank you. Echo the comments from my council members. It's uh, it's rare. I would not have expected having this presentation be engaging before I got on council. But this presentation was engaging, and I appreciate that very much, and I appreciate you guys as well. Thank you. Um, I think we're good. Um, we're going to take a 10-minute break before our next section of the presentation. Um, it is 10.04. We will be back at 10.14. Recording stopped.
All right, we're back, and I think, actually, I'm going to turn it over to City Manager Stannert, because that's what I do now, and yeah. I'll let you bring us up to speed from there. Awesome. Well, we are almost we are almost to the conclusion of this of the study session. So um, we have one more um, section to cover, which is transportation costs. And Steve Marco is back with us to uh, to bring us home, as he's done. So I was just saying, and through the uh, through the entire CFP process, Steve always gets to to bring the last presentation together, and so he's used to it. But Steve, take it away. He's our cleanup hitter. Um, completely. All right, thank you. So um, transportation. At a high level, the recommendation for transportation projects are as follows. Um, continue to fund existing projects until completion. Continue to fund existing capital operating programs at pre-pandemic levels with a couple of exceptions, and I'll go through those. Prioritize the use of transportation impact fees on qualifying multimodal projects, and I'll go through that a little bit. So Continue to fund existing projects until completion. This includes grant-funded projects that have an obligation to be completed. A lot of federal funding, there's a requirement. If you don't finish the projects, you return all the funds you've gotten. Now, there are a few what I call kind of new exceptions. Um, these projects that you see here were not listed on the old adopted CFP, but you have probably seen these in some form or fashion before. So T97 is North Creek Trail Emergency Repair and that's the washout section up in Canyon Park, and we're gonna get FEMA fu emergency funds as um, like, kind of like grant funds, but we still have a little bit of match, which we'll use re two funding. T101 is on Northeast 185th Street, and that pretty much extends from um, the Multiway Boulevard all the way to the fire station, and essentially what happens there is that's the same scope of work that the uh, Sound Transit BRT work's gonna happen. So we are working with them to try to get um, funding for them to actually uh, rebuild the road because the road was built for local traffic and now it's going to be pounded by day in and day out by buses. So before we spend a lot of money rebuilding the road, we want to make sure the old utilities in that road are um, up to snuff so we don't have to go back into the road. So we are using utility funds to do that and then the pavement rebuild, uh, we're working it out with hopefully Sound Transit to essentially pay for that. T-102 is the Main Street Festive Street um, project that um, council, that's one of the uses of the ARPA funding to determine how we would um, close the roads, the Festival Street as well as Main Street, whether it's intermittent or permanent, uh, we're gonna come up with the solution that kind of works for both. Uh, there are various sidewalk and pavement preservation projects that were not on the last CFP because every two years we have opportunities for grant funding. So we put the next list on top in the hope that we can get grant funding. Um, and they're paid traditionally through their respective programs. So programs are one way that we um, get match money for grants. So like pavement preservation, we toss in a number of local funds. What that does is it gives us kind of a local bank for um, matching funds that we can go after grant funding. Sidewalks is the same thing. And then the last project I talked to you, I think, in the summer is the Transportation Demand Management Program for Canyon Park. And again, we're hopeful to get a grant and continue to get the legislative funding, so we included that as well. So capital operating programs, um, we want to fund them, the existing capital operating programs, and bring them back to pre-pandemic funding levels. Uh, we had reduced them, um, many of them, in anticipation of reduced revenue during the COVID, um, uh, the uh, bulk of the COVID, or the greatest impacts of the COVID on the economics. Capital operating programs are ongoing yearly work that need to be done to maintain, improve, and address safety issues on our transportation system. A lot of them are funded by REIT, um, some of them are funded by the Safe Streets and Levy Program, well, two of them. So OP3 is our annual pavement preservation program. It probably has about $3 million a year in there. Um, I think 1.65 is coming from the levy, and we had a certain amount of that estimated by grant funding. And we've actually exceeded and gotten more money for grants, so that's a cool thing. Our bridge program essentially maintains, inspects our bridges, which is a federal requirement. Um, it's paid for by REIT2. Um, there's a larger amount for 2023 because we haven't been spending as much in that 
category, we've been trying to save up a little bit because what we want to do is a type size and lo location analysis for the 102nd Avenue Bridge because that's nearing the end of its life. And one of the key things to do is try to figure out how to replace it, how much it costs, and that's the exercise we want to fund with that. OP5 is neighborhood traffic calming. We haven't been doing too much over COVID. Um, it's RE2 funded, and we want to bring it back up to the 75,000 pre-COVID level in anticipation. Uh, sidewalk and pro uh, walkway program is funded by REIT, but it also is funded by the Safe Street Levy. That one also gets grants, and we have been pretty successful in getting grants as well. Collective Corridor Safety Program, Citywide Child, City Child Pedestrian School and Park Zone Safety Program, that's probably the longest name, um, Safety Upgrade and Replacement Program are all safety projects, and they do several different things. They e either address safety around where kids are going to be, they address um, safety along the cor um, collector corridors, or in the case of OP10, there's like spot locations that need safety things like um, barriers or um, um, attenuators and things like that that we have to work on. Um, the crosswalk program is about $100,000 a year and that's funded primarily by the Safe Streets and School Levy. So these are the ones that we want to maintain and we want to just bring back a little bit to uh, the pre-COVID level. So the two exceptions, OP11 is the bicycle program. So Prior to this, we've been spending only about $25,000 a year to try to get a bike plan done. So it was kind of the planning phase. So what we're recommending now is it's currently working its way through the Planning Commission. Um, actually, we have a meeting tomorrow night to kind of go over it a little bit more. And hopefully by October 19th at the Planning Commission meeting, they'll have a recommendation for council. And then we'll start with the council, we think in mid-November, um, budget time willing, to start going over the bike plan. Um, what staff recommends is maintaining a program, beefing it up to about $500,000 a year, of which about $200,000 we think we can get grants for. It would address things like maintenance, education, storage, and wayfinding. And we did talk to the Planning Commission, and we did get public input, and we think there's about four locations where it's prudent to kind of connect up existing bike facilities. Um, this is either because there's a long stretch of existing bike facility that even though it's on the road, it would make sense to connect it up and in the interim until it gets a full facility, it would have a long corridor. Or there's some sort of safety issue in a um, section like North Creek Trail when it crosses Northeast 195th, there's some safety issues there that would make that trail system a little bit um, better until such time as some sort of longer Wash dot slash city slash UW bottle kind of um, can come up with a lot of money to do actual real, you know, big crossing. Um, let's see. We also note that with the upcoming citywide comprehensive plan update, we hope there will be an ability to collect fees for the non motorized portion of our transportation system. So currently we collect vehicle-based traffic impact fees or transportation impact fees. They can only be used on capacity issues for vehicular projects, okay? So what we're trying to do is get a multimodal um, level of service methodology that will allow us to collect fees for multi multiple modes. So it's not likely we're going to get higher fees for a developer, but that fees that were traditionally used only for vehicles might be split about along different modes, okay? So that could be a source of more funding for the bike program. Another thing is we have a current Safe Street sidewalk levy that sunsets in 2025. And so prior to this, we were assuming there would be a discussion about a levy for starting in 2026. And we assume this could include discussion of um, funding bike facilities in, in addition to pedestrian facilities. So that could be another opportunity potentially for funding for bike facilities. But in the meantime, over the next two years, as we work through the comp plan and we work toward potentially a new levy, um, there's a gap. So what we recommend is dropping $1.5 million a REIT into 2023, and this would be essentially our bank in case we can find some sort of grant that we can start a larger project on. Um, and I think what we're doing is we're working through the public process and the planning commission process to try to prioritize 
segments of the network that we proposed and so that if there is a grant we kind of have this prioritized list that we can start working from the other exception of the um, operating programs is the comprehensive plan the transportation element Early in the year, the staff um, briefed the council on this, and it's gonna, the transportation element's gonna be really significant this year. And I think it's literally gonna set the foundation on how we approach transportation in the future in the city of Baltimore. So the intent is to convert, like I said, to multimodal level of service. We have to address safety, climate change, resiliency, and set ourselves up for non-motorized fees. And this will take quite a bit of effort, and we think in the range of about a million dollars. Um, the assessment uh, was provided during discussions with the council. I think it was in spring. And again, I want to remind that this is just the transportation element. This is not even the community development portion which covers the entire plan. Um, so the intent, since this magnitude of change of the transportation element doesn't happen very often, is to use um, primarily ARPA funds or one-time funding for that. So then the last of the three elements that we propose is pro to prioritize multimodal projects when using transportation impact fees to complete the active transportation system, the bike and pedestrian facilities. So like I told you before, the transportation impact fees can only be used for vehicular capacity projects at this time. But the projects that score well are projects that will provide capacity for vehicle, provide transit if you, you can get it, provide bikes, and provide pedestrian facilities. And these two corridors, they don't have any pedestrian or bike facilities at this time. The capacity would really be putting a third um, two-way left turn lane where necessary. So it's, it will qualify as a multimodal. But the end result is you could probably use the transportation impact fees to compete for better grants as a total facility than to try to get money just for the ped and the bike facilities. So it's a strategy on how to move forward. And we think this is a way to try to get a complete street rather than just use TIF funds for vehicles only. These are the two locations. Um, they're pretty strategic. They would provide north and south corridors for both walking and biking as well as our transportation corridors. Uh, the one thing I will point out for these two projects that we did put design match money in a later year. Remember I told you that if we apply in 2024, you're not going to be able to start to 27. So that is our assumption that's in the CFP, but that doesn't mean that if opportunities for grants come up sooner than that, we have the funding that we can try to go after that sooner. So right now it's shown conservatively in a later year. So when we were talking to the um, Capital Facility Plan Committee, we, they brought up East Riverside Drive Trail, which is a great thing, um, and discussed it as being a priority. Um, the thing about this one is we got to work with King County Parks because they own the, the right-of-way, the old railroad uh, right-of-way, essentially. So they have some constraints to work with, but we have started a regular uh, conversation with them. We're scheduling regular, I don't know if it's every month or every two month meetings with them to try to move forward. Um, we put about $150,000 into planning work to provide us some starting point. So that'll give us a little bit of staff time to come up with that strategy like I talked about for funding and actually work with King County on a strategy of that some sort. And we may get, have to get very creative to try to get this in there. It might not be a traditional way of just building a trail straight through. Um, because of the constraints that King County has. Uh, but we're working on that one. Okay, I think this is the last slide. So this is a good slide. These are changes due to additional funding. So we did get extra funding from the legislature, so we can finish North Creek Trail Section 4 along State Route 524. We're going to probably go out to bid this fall, and we're going to start building the last two phases essentially early next year and hopefully finish by summer. Uh, 228th Street widening, which actually includes protected bike lanes on that stretch. It's a short stretch, but it's, it is a stretch with protected bike lanes. Uh, we were on the contingency list. We didn't get the grant funding the first time, but since we we're on the contingency list, number one, they had extra money come back, so we got a million dollars for right away. So we're funded through right away now. 
You guys know about the Bath Away one. I won't talk about that. Uh, the Bike Box is a really small project. It's a sound transit project to try to get access to their transit stations along 185th. So this would basically paint the bike box on 104th to allow bikes coming down 104th to have a bike box to take a left turn to get to the transit stop there. And then OP6, the sidewalk program, uh, the safe streets and sidewalk levy uh, actually is coming in better in terms of revenue. Um, so we thought the biggest bang would be in the sidewalk program. So it's actually gonna get about $3 million more in 2023 and 2024. So how we plan to use this is we're gonna start designing about, we hope, somewhere between two and four of the sidewalk projects. We have four grants in for sidewalk projects and we're not sure if we're gonna get any or we get some or all. Um, but with that money, we're, we're assured that we can get hopefully a couple of them done at least, even if we have to use our own funds. And we'll try to get it done in sometime in 24 or 25 constructed. That's the transportation um, element. So happy to answer any questions if I can. Council Member Zorns. Just a comment. <clears throat> Every one of these projects matters a lot to everyone. So it, it, or it matters a lot to someone, someone who has to navigate that area. I want to just thank you specifically for the attention that you gave to 9th and to East Riverside Drive. Um, those, those have a extra concern for me because I um, have watched hazards of people trying to navigate both of those. But so thank you for everything and your scope on this. I'm very excited about two, maybe four uh, sidewalk grants, but um, but specifically for those, personally, thank you for, for um, including those. I would echo about, thanks. Um, I would echo about Riverside. Um, that was a relatively new addition based on email feedback, and um, I really appreciate uh, Public Works Director uh, Leonhart for for getting something in there and starting that conversation, making sure that um, that our community down in that area is being heard. Um, I think using an old railroad tie is a very creative solution, and I hope it works out. Um, I do have a question about the um, the multimodal uh, fees that you mentioned. Um, it makes sense what you're saying. We, we do that for cars. And if, you know, e-bikes are outpacing car sales, then what are we doing about building infrastructure for bikes if there's not funds for them? So I'm wondering, um, ha one, has it been considered to, like, tax, put a tax on bikes? I, um, kind of like we put on cars for sale, like at time of sales tax, perhaps. And also, are there any models that you're looking to throughout the country, other countries perhaps, um, that helps provide these fees so that infrastructure can be built for multimodal projects? So the first one, tax on bikes, no, we have not looked or discussed that. Um, I guess that's something we could talk about internally. I don't, I don't, honestly, I don't know where that would go, so. That one might be a legislator thing. I don't know, either. Um, in terms of models, you're talking about multimodal models and how to um, collect fees. Yeah, so there are actually several agencies in the region who have done that. Um, some of them actually did it a few years ago. I think Bellevue started a few years ago and they just um, earlier this year, late last year, adopted the fee part. Um, so it was a process for them. So we do have some models to look at. Uh, my understanding is there's no one way to do it. There are several agencies that are doing it fairly similarly, um, but there are other ways we can look at that. So part of what we're trying to do, hopefully this fall, is start that process and take the city through a process of identifying which methodology that would be appropriate for the city of Bothell. As an example, I think oversimplifying, um, for Bellevue, typically what we do in the past, you would have a um, vehicular level of service requirement. You would have land use and therefore you have more trips and vehicles. And you would have to account for those trips with your bunch of projects that you're gonna build in that 20 year plan cycle. They have to match each other. So 
the simplified way of looking at some of these other models for multimodal is instead of just looking at trips, you look at what you call units of travel. And then they make estimates of how many people are going to um, use sidewalks, how many people would use cycle tracks, how many people would drive in a car, how many people would drive in a transit. You estimate what you're going to build in 20 years and how many units that develops, and that has to match your land use units. So that's one way of doing that. And then it gets a little more detailed on how the fees are actually broken out. But that's kind of one model we can look at. I think there are several others that might just assign fees, not necessarily list a group of projects. So one of the challenges will be, if we go this way, you have to estimate what you can afford in 20 years. And that's where some of these things come in on how much fees are generated, how many grants you can get, um, if there's a levy that can help support all these things. That all works into how much you can do, how many units you can create in 20 years. I'm glad to hear that, that um, there are models out there that you're looking to and, um, and you'll present to them. You'll present some of those to us um, to consider in the future. So, um, you know, it, it, it's always nice to know that as we move forward, there are still guideposts around us, and we can look to them for the future. Thank you. Go for it. Thank you, Mayor. Um, just a quick uh, clarify. Uh, I don't have much to add. I just a uh, clarifying question. When we say East Riverside, we. Uh, we use East Riverside, we use East Riverside Drive, we use East Riverside Trail. Are those the same thing or are they different things? That is actually a really good question. So I think these are our options. So there's a good portion of East Riverside Drive Road that doesn't have bike facility. The existing bike facility is probably just one direction, five foot bike lane and Cheryl's in the other. And then once you get further east, there's nothing. There's um, there's a portion of the same roadway that has sidewalks, either on both sides, most of it, well, one half of it has it on the south side, nothing on the north side, and as you get further east, there's nothing at all. Mm -hmm. um, so one option is to actually build sidewalks, okay? So that's one option. Um, we don't want to build on-street facilities because nobody wants on-street facilities anymore. So the second option is to use the old railroad um, track, essentially, which runs all the way from the senior center all the way to Woodenville, and use that to build a multi-use trail, which would be pedestrians and bikes. Um, that's probably the most efficient way economically to do it, because the cost of building a curb, gutter, sidewalk, planter strip is pretty expensive compared to building a 12-foot wide asphalt path on property you already owned. The problem with that is King County owns the railroad bed, so we have to work with King County, uh, which is not a bad thing, but King County is relatively huge. And you can imagine through King County, there are very many regional trails that they're trying to put together that they prioritize higher than this, this particular stretch. But Bothell, it's high in our list. So that's, that's the conundrum we're kind of in. We really want to do the trail because it makes the most economic sense. We don't think you want to spend double the money to put a sidewalk and a trail at this point because we just can't, can't afford that. We want to prioritize things. Uh, but we do have to get over the, you know, I think there's some limitations on the King County side that we have to overcome. Um, what... And what, like, what does the engagement with King County look? I mean, what does that look like? What What do we need from them? And we need to understand how we can use their land. They have a say on how they're going to use their land. Course. We have to talk about who's going to maintain and own the, own the trail because that's a long term cost. Uh, we have to talk about some other obstacles that you know how we can fund all this and what kind of funds we can use to do all this. So that's why I think what we want to do is give it a little bit of time and try to look at this outside of the box and see what we can do from that point of view. It may be at some point we come back to the council and say, 
this is going to take a long time. Is this high enough a priority that we want to spend some money to finish the sidewalk a certain length on the south side? Even though we know we're going to kind of double up ourselves on the future once that trail breaks loose and we can build the trail. So I think that's the discussion we might might have to have. What's Do you have an idea of what the timeline might be? You know, I don't. I think I'd like to give it to the end of this year and maybe early next year to try to go through a process of brainstorming and see what we can come up with. And this is where I'm saying that we may have very creative solutions that come out that we have to see how that would fly with everybody. Um, but I, I think there's a couple of things we could try and discuss and see if it would work. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I mean, we're interested in this because we've seen in my time on council, very short, albeit very short, I haven't seen anybody as passionate. I haven't seen so many people passionate that they actually took the time to send us emails and ask us about that. You know, they're all concerned, obviously. Um, so, uh, I feel like it's an important thing to consider and, 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 you know, talk about the pros and cons of different options and if there's anything to speed up the process, you know. Yep. Thank you. All right. I have a couple things. Um, first off, I just want to say thank you. Um, the changes that we're talking about here, I think exactly the kind of changes we need um, for a variety of different reasons, and I'm really excited about them. Um, I'm not going to itemize them all. I just want to say thank you. Um, question on the Riverside Drive Trail. Um, that, I believe, is the same old rail bed as East Rail that comes up to Woodenville, kind of parallel to the Sammamish River Trail. and. I could be wrong on that, so tell me if I'm wrong. But it, could we connect into East Rail directly through that? And if so, would there be a win for the county there to add Bothell as an East Rail city officially? We're not right now. And I don't know if we've talked to the city of Woodenville about that at all or if they'd be interested in partnering with us on that. That one, I don't know the answer. Um, I know couple of us internally were talking about the Woodenville side, and I think we had initial conversations with them, and sorry, it escapes me, but there were some hiccups between there and connectivity, I think, um, because we fall a little bit short of getting to that point, so we would have to depend on Woodenville as well. Yeah. So I think this is a three-way conversation, which takes even a little longer, but I think that's, yeah, that's, that's a great question. Okay. Um, the other um, just question I had is why use ARPA funds for the comp plan transportation element or transportation impact fees? I guess do those have to go to capacity or there's, are there no eligible fees in the many different funds that we have? So we looked at using REIT 2. Mm -hmm. There's specific guidance that you cannot use REIT 2 for planning type exercises, which this would be comp plan. Um, transportation impact fee is similar. You cannot use it for planning. You have to essentially use it for implementation. Um, so we were down to one-time money. And the two sources are the frontage, which I believe like when we build the multi-way boulevard, because we built it, we charge the developer for building their frontage. So this is the revenue or payback, whatever you want to call it. That's one source of funding. And the other would be ARPA, which doesn't have any ties to it. We can basically use anything. Okay. Um, I think that's all I've got. It's late. I'm tired. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> you, it's, it's not you. <laughs> um, all right. I think um, Council Conversations is up next. Thank you, Steve. Go for it, Jean. I know you've got something. I, I just have a couple of things. <laughs> One, um, as an old deaf ed teacher, I dropped the ball because uh, September is uh, deaf and hearing, hard of hearing awareness month. And it's kind of a big deal. So I want to do a shout out for that. Um, and then the other thing is I got to do something really cool this summer 
which is tour the uh, Pioneer Cemetery. And I'm hoping that uh, there will be more opportunities uh, for people of Bothell. There's a lot of people interested in the Pioneer Cemetery. So let me tell you about some of the, some of the people who are buried there. <clears throat> I think there were 70 people who fought in, get, uh, fought in the Civil War. 20 of them are buried in the Pioneers, who, who lived in Bothell at some point. 20 of them are buried in the Bothell Cemetery. One of them is buried with a bullet from Gettysburg in his leg. Um, and then uh, five family members, I'm not going to tell you who it is. You'll have to go on the tour and find out lived for about 20 years on top of the, um, oh, why have I forgotten it? The train for smuggling s slaves. Underground, Underground Railroad. Railroad, thank you. It's late. Um, they lived for about 20 years there, and they all, all five of those family members probably had some impact or were touched by it, and they all did various uh tours with different infantries, very cool. And then the other one was someone had been left for dead uh, in a Union um, battle, and the Union retreated, and uh, the Confederates had taken it. Well, at night, a free man found somebody, this guy who was left for dead, hid him away in the attic for a couple nights, then ferried him away over and got a got him across the stream to other other Union troops um, and saved his life. Also buried in our cemetery. So there's really cool history, and I hope um, that there will be more opportunities for folks can, who can uh, take advantage of that. And that's all I have to yak about. And everybody else is just looking at me with tired eyes. So <laughs> I think uh, we're going to call this a meeting. Thank you all. Thank you.